Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. Just to make you aware, this podcast may contain some explicit slash offensive language. And if that's not your thing, you don't have to listen. But I have given you a warning. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. You don't know the half of it, but yeah, um, I'm anyway. So yeah, I'm, good, on, mate. I'm skating on the thinnest <laughs> ice known to man. Like. He said, and um, they put a poison in the tank that just instantly kills them. He went, and we've run out of it, so we cut their heads off with shovels. Suddenly, bang! The whole boat exploded. Take your sort of eight-inch-long piranha and imagine that at four, five, maybe six feet. I said, I've revived your dead fish. <laughs> F off, he said. You haven't. That was just humongous. It was... I couldn't believe what I was looking at. I'm just battling this fish out and on. I know it's a black man. I'm, yeah. I'm saying I'll never be a naughty boy again. If you catch fish and you return them to the water, then you are my brother. Steve Broad, welcome to the Nash Podcast. How are you? Very well, thank you. How are you, mate? Mate, I'm really good. All the better for seeing you, mate. I'm trying <laughs> to think the last time that I think I saw you... Not in the flesh was on a TV screen on a particular series on Discovery Home and Leisure or Shed. I don't know what it was called at the time, but it was Real Wars, mate. Do you remember that? I'm guessing you do. Oh, God. Yeah, that is a long time ago. But great. Brilliant thing to do. A proper boy's own adventure. Getting the opportunity to go out and survive on what you caught. (laughs) Yeah. You've talked about it with your mates down the pub. And you're like, oh, yeah, I could do that. I could do that. Dead easy, dead easy. Try it. <laughs> yeah, it looked granite, mate, to be fair. It looked granite, but it was a mega series. And to be fair, there were subsequent things. It's just coming flooding back to me now. Obviously, all your angling times work and the work you did on Carp Crew, mate. So, you, mate, you've done it all, really. Angling angling sort of media, TV, the lot, mate, for, for a lot of years. I was very lucky, very lucky. I just fell into it by accident. Um, not by design. I met a guy who worked on Angling Times called Richard Lee, who at the time was the news desk editor. And we became friends and I used to fish with him and chat about things. And I was doing a lot of bream fishing at the time uh, for Biggins in Shropshire and Cheshire. And he used to, I used to do a little write up and send the slides off and it'd stick him in AT. And then uh, one day he phoned me up and he said, uh, Brody, I've got I've got my job. I said, What job, Rich? He went, editor of Angling Times. He said, Do you want a job? I went, Oh, Rich, don't take the piss out of me. Don't take the piss out of me. You know I'd love to do that. Don't make fun of me. Put the phone down. The phone's back up and he goes, No, Brody, I'm being serious. I'm going, Rich, it's not funny, mate. It's not funny. You know it's something I want to do. It's not funny. I should point out at that point, I had been for an interview at Angler's Mail. Had you? Yeah, and failed. <laughs> and, and he goes, no, no, I mean it. Come, come, come. That was it. I think he said, told me that on, I think that was a Wednesday. And I think by the following Wednesday, I was in Peterborough. No way. <laughs> yeah. So that's how it all Life st- changer, literally. Yeah. O- overnight. Before that point. So there's a prominent feature or state mark in in the old life cycle there. Mm. But before that point, what was life? What was life like? Because you went northwest, weren't you? Yep, um, right at the top of the north, North Staffordshire. Right. So grew up around the waters that define you, or where you start, and they were Reedsmere, Capesthorne, wow, um, the Serpentine, which the northwest lads will know, uh, and it was. You talked in hushed tones about the mangrove and Fenamere. Yes. Yeah. And uh, anybody that fished the mangrove was like, <laughs> yeah, God. Yeah. So when you came across them on Reedsmere or Cape Sun or wherever you were, Crab Mill or whatever, you, you were like, uh, 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 sir, uh, yeah. sir. <laughs> and it was, it was marvellous. It was marvellous time because it's so different now. We were in Staffordshire, Stoke, Stoke, Cheshire. Yeah. And at that time, at one point, you could name every single 30-pound carp mm. there was in both counties. Because it was dead easy. There was three. Yeah. Hardly <laughs> so, any. Yeah. You know, I can remember the opening days on on Reedsmere when the guys are having like 
twenty-nine pound commons and things and thirty ones, and you're like, oh my god, never mind a thirty-five or a forty. You were just blown away by these things, and it it changed. So started on those, cut my teeth there. Um, Is that where you started on menus like that? Literally, I started on a on quite literally a farmer's pond, yeah. and bizarrely, it was full of little tiny crucians and little tiny mirrors and commons. And I learned to float fish. You get snapped up occasionally. And then I was fishing crust for four and five pounders. Yeah. Then meat, then cat food. And you sort of go on. You go on with the the cycle. And I started um, proper carping was Turner's Pool, just below the roaches. Right. Um. That was one of the Isled stock places, really shallow little thing, right on the edge of the Peak District. You could see the rocks in the background, and it was just full of carp to sort of 15, 16 pounds. Okay. So that was massively exciting. You felt like a carp angler. Yeah, proper carp. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, got the Maddox jumper. You know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and it was all of those, and then it was the – there was Nipers at Serpentine, Nipers Lee, and the Mill Pool. Yes. They all stepped down, and that was Cheshire Anglers. And a lot of the guys that fished there were from Kids Grove on the edge of the potteries, and a lot of those fished the mangrove. Right. So that was the connection. Of There's that. the link, yeah. yeah. And they were going, Luke, mate, that, that's not right here. Yeah. This is how we do it. This is a hair rig, and this is that, and all the all the rest of it, and it just blew me mind. Just blew me mind. I'm there with an Arsley bomb and split shot on the line, and a bit of this and a bit of that, and they're going, "Oh no, here's anti tangle tube. Yeah, here's Dacron. Here's a hair rig. Here's a boily." When they showed me a pop up, oh, my mind was melted. I was ruined. <laughs> yeah. Just absolutely ruined. <laughs> it's witchcraft. It's yeah. just witchcraft. And that's where you go. And then, of course, you get the hunger. Reeds, man. Cape Stone. All of those. And I'd, I had my first 20 off the, off the SERP. Yes. And then went on, I think, I think probably my third or fourth 20 was off Reeds, man. And that fish was also, bizarrely, Three years later on, it was a bit of a spawny, horrible thing. It was actually my first 30 as well. Was it? Same, same fish. Same fish. And it had just sort of gone, looked like somebody got a foot pump on it. And it gone, <laughs> what, wasn't a looker, really. Well, I was taking it, <laughs> No, I was taking it all day long. Yeah. I've got a picture of it somewhere, and I'm like, sort of hugging it like this, <laughs> like this good, in case it bursts. <laughs> that time, that time on that venue, that venue is iconic. When I think of Reedsmere, Cape Storm, I've had Rob Gillespie on, I've had Frank Warwick on, I've had a Numpcast Ferrum, I've had yeah. loads of people. It's very much that northwest side synonymous with producing quality anglers and also quite innovative sort of mindset in terms of rigs, in terms of baits, in terms of how to capture those fish. Oh, mate, definitely. So at that era, you got the input of... The mangrove guys that were very ultra cult and slightly older than the Frank Frank Warwick and that group that were coming through. And the innovation that was there was massive. I mean, from indicators, can you remember the old with the Fuji rings mm. to make mon- monkey climbers with yeah. the nicked isotopes in them? Yeah. That's all reads me. Is uh, it? Yeah. And then you had the thread in the bottom. So you could put weights on. All of that. We, we all know Frank's story. I mean, massive yeah. innovation. Bait rockets were from there. All sorts. The can't remember what everybody the casting ground bait thing. That's from that's from Reed Smith. That was a guy called Steve Bethel, Bertie. All of those little ideas all came from that one little hotbed. I think because the fishing was crap. Everybody had, everybody had to do something. And they were obsessed, so it came out in rod building, bait, all sorts. What and, a place to be, mate. And then the next generation was the Gas Ferrums, Ali and, and yeah. Rob Gillespie. All of those were after after me. I'm an old man. They're, they're the, the younger ones. <laughs> so it still had 
another rebirth of yeah great anglers coming and cutting the teeth there and then spreading the wings. It was, I think, and I sort of hark back to this a lot and get hammered for this, but there, the northern sort of scene in terms of it, maybe its depth and its availability of big ends, the fact that that complex might not have had the stock or whatever in terms of numbers, but as a breeding ground and a melting pot for all the anglers where it was relative in locality, it seemed to be like the perfect sort of storm of everybody coming together, didn't it? It was, and because there were so few venues, when yeah. you look at it, now carp have spread through the northwest. Yeah. I mean, the isle created most of the waters in the northwest, with those fish being moved around legally or not. There was both cases. But if you think you actually knew... You almost knew where you were going. There was Hawk, the Serpentine, Reedsmere, Cape Sword, and then you got Crab Mill, Plex Flash. Yeah. Winsford Flashes were just starting then. You got the Carp Society waters that, that appeared on the scene. But it that little call of pool of waters created, I mean, God, Kevin Clifford used yeah. to travel in the 70s to fit, go and fish Crab Mill. Yeah. That's how we were. We were so lucky that there was a strong hold of carp in in that area. So we'd got carp, and we got old carp. Mm. So more than anywhere else, when we're reading about Savvy and all the pits down south that really made the grade, we'd almost got our own in our little way because we're lucky because we got the Isle that created all of those things. Yeah. And a lot of forward thinking. The guys that, that looked after Reesmere, Liz and Jeff and all of those, they they were very forward thinking in creating and managing these waters. You know, you must you must remember that the fishery managers for open fishing clubs, not syndicates, open fishing clubs, had a lot of foresight to, to manage, look after them and deal with the problem. God, people in little green mushrooms want to go fishing for 24, 48 hours. <laughs> yeah. Not a woodbine and a wicked basket or quill in sight. It was like, ooh, all alien. Loads of guys in army jumpers running around. <laughs> he's, yeah. he's like nutters. But they adapted. And I think probably they were they were very good because they would get we got carp anglers on committees, all that sort of thing. So that's why that bit stayed as it was. And created it. It's a very good thing. Very good thing. And now the legacy is still there. Yeah, exactly. I was just about to say that future proof has gone through to this next generation. Even still, your your experience angling on there, mate, in terms of reeds, mere Cape Sorn, and the surrounding waters, synonymous with a bit of range work, obviously, with terms of reeds, mere, but also the the makeup of the lake being quite silty and that whole sort of thing. How how did that all play out in terms of you, your angling, where you're at at the time when you went on there? Oh. Set off woefully under-equipped. Um, just really, really under-equipped. I mean, I think my first proper rods were Conaflexes. 11 foot 6, 1 and 3 quarters Conaflexes. Glass. <laughs> right. With some random reel. I think it might have been a Browning. Okay. may have been. It was either a Mitchell or a Browning. And you're looking, we thought you were going big guns, 12 pound Silcast. <laughs> Twelve pound silk cast, great. Yeah. Mustard O'Shaughnessy hook, off we go. We're all sorted. So for me, because I didn't come from, I had no fishing in my background. Yeah, I was sort of learning from when I was on the bank. So I didn't know that I looked like stick of the dump turning up with mismatched rods and, yeah, yeah, cool. and bizarre bike, bite alarms and all sorts of things. But then you soon learn because you go, cool, that looks good. Look at him. He's got two matching rods and matching reels. and That's a big net. What's that thing? An unhooky man, what's one of them? <laughs> Again, yeah. that was the era. And it changed. And then we got, and as you change, you learn. So I think my first... I think then I must have moved on to some teeth. Terry used as T32s. Yeah. Um, 
and I think I had some cardinals, but they were they were the I think they were the one five five, not the fifty five. Poor relation, poor shoddy, really. Step uh, up though from the previous. <laughs> yeah, oh, go oh, the yeah. right way. Yeah, and then I think the first carbon was twelve foot three pound test curve tricast. Yeah, and four thousand five hundred C spin. Which wasn't the best casting reel in the world. No. It used to come off like barbed wire. <laughs> <laughs> but and of course the girl we were seriously going ninety yards, hundred yards was a long way. And then you got the lights of Frank mm. going over the ton and several other people, you know, it was so you pushed all the time. And then you became obsessed with distance. Which was hilarious. You'd be obsessed with distance. And then there used to be a guy called, oh, God, what was his name? He was a fireman. <sighs> Can't remember his name. Uh, and he used to just follow the wind religiously and fish all the corners and snag trees. And catch him. And catch him. <laughs> and I, oh, I bumped into him. He's a few few years ago still really nice and i can't remember his name that's just, that's shocking on my part but all of a sudden i'd gone from trying to achieve what was awful at casting a long way at the time because I, I wasn't equipped yeah and it was fr- and it was frustrating and i hadn't mastered the art and and it was just hard work and was never quite I was never quite in control of what I was doing, which is why I called bugger all. <laughs> but then I met this guy, and he's he's got a little tub of tiger nuts, and he's just flicking them out under some trees and catching fish. And I'm like, oh, oh, you don't need to chuck out there. They're here. <laughs> great eye-opener, great learning curve, and just set you on the right stead. So there was almost two camps on Reedsmere at that particular point, you either fished in the edge or you you fished out. Out, yeah. And that was also the time when some of the guys um, did the mass baiting thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was the time of hemp, grout, and and getting a size six and putting as many maggots on the size six as you could and just fishing it over 10 kilos of hemp. Top, spotted as tight as you possibly could and all that silt and just getting you caught by accident not by design That's just because you yeah, just because you got them feeding i bet some of the fizzing up must have been in ridiculous oh mate it was again it was just different times but these guys were so dedicated they were doing they were doing seasons for a couple of 20s yeah yeah you know, and they were talking about going to like roman lakes in the winter to to get a bend in the rod or wherever. And it was like, I don't know, exciting. Yeah. Be- uh, well, again, I understand why Frank's boat was called Every Bit of Blue, because at that particular time, in your head, every bit of blue that you saw was potentially the next Red Mire. Of course it wasn't, <laughs> but in your head, yeah. it was like the excitement was massive. And... I suppose in my naivety at the time, I didn't know enough. The information wasn't there. So I genuinely believed it. I genuinely believed it that there could be a 40 pounder in this little pond just up there that was like eight foot across or something, perhaps an exaggeration. But it was exciting because you believed the magic was still there. And when you read stuff of stuff that Nash had done at the time, because that was probably when the writings about Silver End and all of that were, yeah, were all yeah. about. And all of those things, Savvy, Harefield, yeah. Essie, all of those were like an alien wor- world up to a point. And you used to meet guys on Reeds me that had travelled to Yately, fish Savvy on a day ticket, done this, done that. And you were like in awe of them. And what they were, what they were, the information you brought, you fed on the information that brought back, and that made you go further and further and further. And I think that was the thing. We were this little sleepy bit up there, yeah, 
the urge from some of the guys was massive to go carp fishing and spread spread the wings, and they did, and but almost brought the information back, back as well, yeah. which galvanised everybody else to do it. So we must have been like a little plague of northern ants going, "Ooh, new carp!" Like, dum, 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 dum. and we did. They, they went everywhere. There was loads of northern lads on Harefield, loads yes, on yeah. on Yately had its fair share. You know, Frampton was another one that a lot of the northern lads went to. Horseshoe, another one that they went mm. to. So they became travelling anglers because the size of fish they were after at that point weren't where they were fishing. No, they had to move. So they had they had to travel. And with that, you share that information yeah. across. And and everything changes, doesn't it? Everything goes. And they, they were very enlightening times then because everything was new. You know, I, I can remember having original Del Reed alarms with the sounder box and the little leads. And I, I met a bloke who went, oh, yeah, I'll just put your speaker in it and a volume control on it. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> what on yeah. earth? Wow, mate. Yeah, but they're, like, they're magical times. Everybody looks back at those times with, like, rotating the glasses, even those that weren't there. But it's the formation of everything, isn't it? Like you said, that me- that melting pot of, like, North and south, the northern anglers having to travel, the southern anglers having the waters with mm. that yep. size of carp in it, and it being spread through the grapevine in terms of methods, baits, whatever it would be. That was how it transmitted. There weren't social media, was there? No. There was a few mags, don't get me wrong, of course there was. But realistically, that was the small amount of contributors that would actually publicise something. But that network and that grapevine of travelling anglers were how information was transmitted, wasn't it? Oh, definitely. But you loop back, so you've got, the northwest, a little enclave of carp anglers. Mm. Then you've got North Lincolnshire, yeah. another little enclave. Because I remember you've got Hutchie and Basie. Yeah, of course, up they're in northern the, boys, aren't they? North, well, North Lincolnshire, Lincolnshire boys. Yeah. So they'd got their little tiny bit of historic old carp there. So there was carp anglers, Brian Hankins, all of them. And they started travelling. Mm. And those collective minds met met up you you look at some you look at some of the fox a lot of the guardian light in fox yeah. northern guys yeah you've got ali hamidi northwest you've obviously got everybody from lincolnshire as well the sheffield lot with neutral yeah. and all that. so there's a lot that has been created where there was no carp <laughs> it's mad isn't it really when you think about it yeah and you look back and think oh but they were the pioneers, all of them, and they were travelling. Can you imagine what it must have been like in 19... Let's go for 1980, for argument's sake. Telling your missus, I, I'm, I'm just going down to North London inside the M25 to go fishing for a week. How does that make any sense? How did you get away with it? Well, also, how could you find it as <laughs> yeah. well, mate? Like, a lot of, there's no sat nav, is there? You're not printing out an AA route planner. You, you're just going on a yeah. on info, an intel. And I think it's great. Yeah, they were the, they were the beautiful times, and that's where innovation all came from because people swapped ideas, and it was a everything was starting out. Now we tend to reinvent the wheel. Then we were inventing the wheel. Yeah, for you the prominent the prominent moments in terms on there we talked about your first twenty thirty and and that whole thing, but the actual angling elements that really sort of resonated with you, your learning curve on there. What what sort of things did you pick up? It was about baiting. It it was about watercraft. It was about casting. They were the three things that were with me because I became, inadvertently, became good. And that only came about when I moved. Mm. So I went into the the Angling Times... And all of a sudden, I'm talking to people that did it for a living. Yeah. I'm talking to my heroes, proper heroes. What was work before that, mate? Uh, I was a tree surgeon. So you literally, one day, your mate goes, I've got a job. You can come and work too. It's in Peterborough. It's angling times. Jobs are good and come and join me. You thought he's blagging you, but you've gone. And then you've gone from tree surgeries at Dunnett over to, the, over to Peterborough. Well, 
yeah, it's a, it's a bizarre one. So tree surgery predominantly did a few bits and pieces, but just at that time, I'd been working for about a year in a chemical plant. What? Because the chemical plant did continental shifts, right? And they suited fishing. Perfect. So yeah. not only was it well paid because it was a chemical plant, you were likely to come out with two heads at any given opportunity. <laughs> If it was one of those, the river the river going through Leet used to change colour all the time. Oh. Um, thankfully, it's all good now. But uh, So it was there because that was a lifestyle. I wanted to go fishing, whether it was carp, whether it was bream, whether it was pike, whatever. I was obsessed with fishing. So you need a couple of things to be exercise that demon, and that is time and money. Yeah. And that was the job. And quite literally, the day that Rich phoned me was the day I was offered to go on to full time on Continental Shifts. I think it was the day after, actually. And I still went for Angling Times. Yeah, I mean, there's (laughs) one thing being allowed the time, but if you can do it for a living, it's different, isn't it? But as you know, sometimes doing what you love for your living, takes the shine off it because you know too much. Did you worry about that, though? No, I was too thick. Yeah. No, I was absolutely too thick. To me, it was just, yeah, let's just do it. This is, yeah, 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 this is brilliant, Luke. And it was. It was like, this is brilliant not being able to speak because Terry Hearn had just phoned you up to, to bollock you over something and you go, you go. <laughs> so when you first went in, like, that starting point, what what did that look like in terms of like your duties and responsibilities? I was proper junior. I mean, basically, I was thirty two then. Well, yeah, yeah. So I was a trainee. Absolutely, I was working with seventeen, eighteen year old. <laughs> right. The bizarre thing was that I suppose because of the background, I knew quite a lot of people anyway, and knew the history of things, and knew where things had come from. And also, massive reader. I was obsessed with angling, angling literature. So you can imagine when you're 13, 14, and there actually been a handful of books. Yeah. And I mean a handful. And then all of a sudden we were in that, then Tiger Bay and Foxpool, and, and more and more books were being published, and the magazines were growing, carp, Cart World had started as well. I, right. I, I remember vividly walking into the high street in, in Leek and going into the news agents, and there was the opening. There, there was Cart World, the first one with Rod on the front in his sleeping bag. And I'm like, what? A magazine about cart fishing? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yeah. Little did I know, all those years later, I'd be editor of it. That was a bit bizarre as well but we'll get to that later. But very, I I was hungry for information. So learned, and luckily for me, Kev Green was there. Yeah. So Kev did most of the carp content, and I was just doing normal reporting to begin with. But as Kev progressed, I sort of followed Kev into his roles because I was the only one that had got any interest in carp fishing. Right, so the rest weren't interested. No, not at all. Right, so that makes sense then. So I sort of followed. I was really lucky. I, I, honestly, talk about luck. I followed Kev. Kev, yeah, yeah. You well, yeah. And uh, you know that came to as what started all this. So that came. Carp even, crew, didn't it? Yeah, even that. So Kev did angling TV and carp crew. So that was his baby. He was the guardian light behind that. And then Real Wars came about because it was the time of Big Brother. Big Brother had just hit the television. I'm going to say yes. I can't put a date on it. I'm trying to think back to when it must that was. be. It must be early 2000s. Maybe, yeah. Uh... Probably, probably a bit more than that. Probably 2004, 2005, maybe. Right. It's there somewhere. But the reality show ethos mm. had caught everybody. So as you do, you want to jump on the bandwagon. 
as a publication. So we were trying to think of how we could create something for the paper that was a lifestyle thing. And we basically came up with uh, the, the survival idea. Yeah. Absolutely. The, the finished product and what the idea was bear no resemblance. So we were basically thinking that you'd go down and fish the Grand Union Canal in London and survive and eat, or you'd be poaching in the Scottish Highlands avoiding a gamekeeper or what that sort of thing, this very live on the bank, sneaking around, doing things. And we wrote we wrote it all up and we discussed it and discussed it and we basically decided that it wouldn't work in a paper format. It was right. just too – you needed interaction with the person that was doing it. It wouldn't have worked. Um, so, like I say, Kev had got all the connections there, Franklin Times TV, car crew, all the rest – and he was tremendously skilled at that and very charismatic at that, so was good at it. So we presented this idea, nothing to do with me. Rich Lee and Kev went and presented the idea to Discovery. It all got banded around a bit, and there was a bit of this and a bit of that, and, we, and then they came up with this concept of two people fishing in competition – surviving mm. and that's where it all came from and then my involvement again and talk about luck was because kev was busy i was tasked with sorting out they got rob the other guy that, that did real wars slightly posh fly anger yeah yeah so they already got rob because he was perfect massively eccentric hilariously funny yeah you look madder than a box of frogs it was brilliant absolutely brilliant mate and he was like that in real life, there was no act, no nothing. No, I can get, I <laughs> he, 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 was, he was typical like Carper meets Fly Angler as well, wasn't but, it? So they got him, yeah, and then they wanted the counterpart. So I was given the job of getting all the people together to be interviewed, well, screen tested. Oh, right, for, for the, yeah, yeah, okay. So we did it over two days at a little fishery just down the road from Peterborough, and uh, we had the great and the good from the fishing world. You're joking. No, no, I'm not, to come and do interviews for it. There was Kev, Jan Porter, there, there was loads of people that came and did it. Oh, I didn't realise that. Yeah, and I was organising it. So I'd been with basically the producer, the director, and the film crew for the two days, because... I'm introducing the people. Yeah, people, this is, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Getting, facilitating at that moment. And then right at the very end of it, the guy that was doing it all said, come on, Brody, let's do you. And I went, what? I said, nobody's interested in listening to my terrible droney voice and little fat chubby cheeks. I did have hair then, though, nearly. You did have hair. I, I did have some hair. It was more of, a, more, more of a comb over Sweepy. It. I liked it. Brentwood Swoop, we'll call it, mate. Yeah. It was more Bobby Charlton than Brentwood. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I did this bit to camera, and that that was that. never thought a single thing about it. Two or three weeks later, word comes back. They've decided on the format, and they've decided on the second person. So me, Rich Lee, and Kev... Go in a room. Bear in mind, Kev had also done a screen test for it. Oh, he hadn't. Yeah, so we all go in this room. Oh, and that's we're, awkward. And we're, we're talking through it, and the guy went, and, yeah, we've got a guy. It's Brody. You just say, no, nah, come on, mate. <laughs> no. And the room went silent, and I went, me? And he went, yeah, you're perfect. What? So Because I'm a thick northerner, and he's a great big tall posh bloke. And he went, that's exactly it. You're the perfect... Polar opposite, yeah. Absolute polar opposite. How you look, how you sound, how you act, your outlook, you are polar opposites. And that's how it came about. And I'm, and I'm, like, I'm just sat in this room going... Uh, uh, you ain't done any TV or nothing? No. Nothing, not a single thing. 
And it was, I remember it being quite out there because it had that survival element. Yeah. And you were like, one day you'd be on the coast. You'd be like, I think you had like certain tackle that you could have or you had to, there was loads oh. of different bits and it was a quality show. Oh God. I'm, I'm surprised that it hasn't, with the resurgence of mm. fishing TV, I am so surprised somebody hasn't, Re- redone that idea. It is Bear Grylls meets fishing, isn't it? Yeah, but can you imagine a because sp- now celebs are into it? Can you imagine a celebrity version of that? Yeah, what great watching. Well, it's well, deep. let's not pitch this on air, bro. Let's <laughs> do it, mate. Well, look, think about it. It's fishing and jungle mixed together, isn't it? Yeah, it hundred percent is. Yeah, it's the jeopardy of both. It's the jeopardy of the whole thing. So I'm I'm ever so surprised that it's not been nicked. What was it like filming? Because you were actually like sleeping out rough, surviving and doing all that. Or was it all made up? Oh, God, no, mate. I wish it had been made up. I, I I would love to sit here and say, oh, yeah, every night we went down to the local pub, had a seven-course meal, got pissed, had a nice night's sleep, and we all shipped out the following day. You rubbed a bit of mud around yourself and went, oh, God, it's all horrible, I'm starving. Uh, the problem was we were. Yeah, it looked a few times pretty. When you like didn't opt for a tent and it we went down all night. So how it worked was um, we went out and we were in three-day sections, basically. Right. So we had two nights on lo- on a location and then, we, and then there was the interim moving bits, which, which were all part of the story. Um, we sort of... That flowed, and then you had the camera crew. You had the camera crew for late one one night, so potentially first night when you'd moved, you had them from the move to dark. Yeah. Then the following day, you had them early till tea time, and then they book it off. And the worst one, and I'll never forget it, is Rob and I are on this island, and I do mean lump of rock mm. about half a mile off the you know not out in the atlantic or anything but off the coast and it was a lump of rock it wasn't anything else but a lump of rock and i'll never forget sat there and it was pissing down yeah it's blowing a gale and i'm Sat with me back against the wall, watching a boat disappear, and they're talking. They're talking about what they're going to have in the restaurant that night, and I'm sat on a lump of rock with Mad Rob. <laughs> That's bleak, mate. Isn't it? No, the, it got worse. So we were quite in good condition then, as in no bits had started dropping off. But but when we were on the sort of nineteenth, twentieth, twenty first day out. So I got sheep ticks. Yeah. All at my back because we were asleep on the floor. Uh, cold, the, the situation you're talking about, I decided in my infinite wisdom, and once again I re- reiterate, I am not very clever. So what do you do? I will ignore a tent when there's a storm coming in. I'll ignore cooker on the... I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll have some extra fishing tackle where I can't fish anyway because it's a storm. I just remember the, I think it was a shot of you in the morning just looking absolutely hammered with the elements, mate. Couldn't talk. Yeah. You were, you were like chattering your teeth. I was, I was, I was so cold and I had to wait because that's what, that way it's the jeopardy of the film and the, the entertainment seemed broadly mm. suffer. <laughs> Put me in a cage and poke me. Yeah. Um, and they going, no, you're going to have to say that again, Stephen. I'm going, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. And, and I couldn't. I genuinely could not talk. <laughs> I was what, just... a, what a series, mate. It's flooding back to me. I used to watch it every single episode religiously. Oh, and you got to see me with no clothes on as well. Yeah, you did get naked at one point, didn't you? Yeah, well. For a wash, wasn't it, or something? Yeah. So Which is I, fair, dude. I, I had um, uh, a lady photographer, film person. Mate, that's why you were naked. Right. <laughs> and we got on really well. And we had a, a the sound person was a guy called Loris, I think his name was, who was uh, just a funny little 
chap. <laughs> and very funny, very good dynamic, and they were brilliant to work with. And she basically said to me, right, we need to get this this scene sorted because you have to mirror what the other person's doing. Of course, I don't know that. They only know that when the, the two camera crews yeah, talk or whatever. Talk, yeah, yeah. So there has to be some sort of communic- overlap. So Rob had done a swimming scene. So she says to me, we need to do a swimming, washing, some sort of thing. Da, 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 da. And I jokingly said, yeah, well, I'll just get my kit off. And she said, yeah, do whatever you like, love. You know, it's fine. It'll make it. So she's actually on the sticks in the waters, right on the edge of the water. And I'm meant to walk straight past the right shoulder and sort of cutting across in front of the camera and then dive into the lake and come up washing. So I must have been dehydrated or, I don't know. So I thought it was a really good idea to take all my clothes off. I just walked past and then I dived in. It was the same again. I popped back, I popped back up. It was that cold. I've gone. <laughs> oh and then I thought, I've got to get out of here. And we bloody, the old man's looking like a cocktail sausage. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't the look, was it? It wasn't the impressive statement that I was going to make. Coming out, oh, look, little yeah. lad. Oh, bless him. Oh, Loris and Doris, mate. Yeah, one, you know. Oh, dear, they would have looked at me, poor little ginger bugger. God, I think there's some weird <laughs> stuff going on with Loris there, mate, and Doris, if they wanted a bit of you naked on camera. No. It's a different show, that is. God, no. I, look, I just look like a deflated orangutan <laughs> trying to dry myself. Man. <laughs> you caught some naked. I remember you catching a few pike, some pollock. We caught all perch. Yeah, we caught all sorts. And again, to have the opportunity to go out and practice what. Honestly, I guarantee it, you. You must have had the conversation. Oh God, yeah. yeah let yeah, me yeah. go. I can go out. I could have done that. I would have yeah. caught this, that, and the other. I would have eaten like a king. And uh, no, we starved. Granite, absolutely <laughs> granite. And the hilarious thing was when we finished and uh, Rob had got, I lost, and Rob had gone off to have his meal and all the rest of it. When that was all finished, obviously he hadn't gone for a meal, it was just the setup mm. because we were going for a meal after the film had finished to thank everybody. <laughs> so quite literally, five o'clock that afternoon, we'd finished filming. Yeah. We'd been out for 20-odd days. And by half past six, we're back in a hotel. I'm like going, light switch, water, toilet. Yeah. And it was 20 minutes we're downstairs. 20 minutes. So I had a shower, got changed, went down. Of course, Rob and I were both like pig in a sweet shop. It was like... A mess. Yeah. Halfway through, I didn't feel very well. Yeah. Went to the toilet and I walked in, walked in through the toilet door. Sorry for sharing this. I do apologise for sharing this. Uh, as I walked into, this is in a very nice restaurant on the west coast of Ireland. I walk in only to hear. No. And that was Rob. Yeah. Who'd beaten me to it, but I was about to join him in his cubicle going. Oh. Brutal, mate. <laughs> we were absolutely minging. Both, both ill, but we had a great catch. We had a day of, um, once they'd edited, it was edited, all put together, and cre- so it was then the fish, finished show. Mm. Uh, and we got invited down to London to see it and then do all the promotion for it. So radio interviews and little film clips. It's like and all. a full on celeb, isn't you? <laughs> no, no, no. So we go down. Rob and I, and uh, it was just hilarious that we did interviews like this, radio interviews, but the two of us together, and it was just great. It was hilarious because we were bouncing off each other because we actually hadn't been together. Yeah, of course. We'd only seen each other at, at the end of, of each bit. So we'd, we'd probably had an hour together to have a cheeky fag or something because you nicked it off somebody because he wouldn't let us smoke. We didn't have any fags or anything. Oh, there. shut up. No. What? They didn't even give you that? No, not at all. And honestly, every time we come off, there was the same guy, little Irish guy, worked for the Inland Fisheries Board, 
and he was driving the pickup that we jumped in and out of. And I could see his role. He's on the cab and I'm going, what are they now? And he's like, fast yeah, into. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it was, it was great. And you look back at it and just think it was just really funny. Mate, incredible. Like, I don't know, it's just me just being incredibly influenced. But I just thought the series was unbelievable, mate. I really enjoyed that, like, the both the mix of it and stuff. And l- you say it so clearly, and I can still see myself saying it. Whenever you see, like, Bear Grylls, the island, you think, yeah, my luxury aren't going to be a fishing rod and an absolutely <laughs> ain't it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I'll be 40 stone by the time I've finished, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No yeah. fish left in the ocean, yeah. mate. yeah. And yeah, in reality, it's probably a completely different matter, mate. But that was like, I can't believe you got, I suppose it's just casted off that part in terms of you haven't really, you haven't really gone for it, but you've just been the perfect cast member to, to supplement like the say, job. Very, very luck again. And it was pure luck. It wasn't by design. It was pure luck. And it was great to have done. And since then, it's really weird. So you go fishing. I fish all over Europe because I enjoy it. Yeah. Um, especially like fishing in Holland, just because I like the Dutch very much. Just go over, perch fishing, carp fishing, see some friends there. And you forget that they've seen all those programs. Yeah. So you walk into a bar in, in the Netherlands and some complete random stranger will tap you on the shoulder and go, real wars. <laughs> That's <laughs> mad, <isn't laughs> and Honestly, and you go... Yes, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like a lab again. Do you want me to sign your clogs, lad? Or yeah. what do you want me to do, boy? <laughs> great. I was so, again, you just have to say, just so lucky. And it worked. It could have so easily not worked. I don't, I don't know how it didn't span for longer. Do you know what I mean? I really don't. Again, you, you look at it now and you think, hmm. We said earlier, I think that it could be reworked and could the the idea behind it is a is a great format to launch somebody else. We've got celebs out there now want to go fishing. Yeah, you just get yeah, exactly. Mate anybody would watch get it. Some posh it, tough and a working class hero and you've done. But it'd be it would be watching your star suffer starving to death out in the elements. Yeah. So it's jungle meets fishing, and you get to see somebody suffer. Perfect. Great TV. Mass market. <laughs> There's plenty of people that put themselves through it as well, mate, I'd imagine. Yeah. But <laughs> like, like I say, very, very proud of what was done, but it wasn't me that did it. It was the creators that did it, and, you know, I was there along from the ride. I was a bit of baggage, and it was great to ride on the shirt tails of that for – the last sort of 15, 20 years, because everybody speaks really highly of it, which makes it nice for you. There's never, oh, God, you look like a knob. That was awful. It's always really positive. Oh, poor you. Yeah, it was great. How hard was that? Yeah, I thought it was brilliant, mate. I really, really enjoyed it. But it, to be fair, that weren't your last appearance on TV, mate. No, I've, I was lucky that we've carried on, obviously, again, slightly because of connection with... Angling Times, yeah. Um, Danny Fairbrass very kindly wanted me to do some some of their stuff on the thinking yeah. tackle bits and bits and pieces. Which again, as I said to you when you asked me to do this whole podcast, anyway, I was a bit perplexed and scratched. And I said to Danny, I said, "Me?" And he went, "Yeah." yeah. Was that on Green? Was that your local venue though? Wasn't it? Oh, we did loads. We did, did loads. You loads. Yeah. So we did. Uh, method feeder versus spotting on that was on Oxley's. Linear, yeah, I remember that. That we packed up the day that it started raining that flooded the linear complex for the no. first time. That was that weekend by Sunday, Monday, where we were fishing was under six foot of water. Mad, mad. So we did linear. We did... Didn't you take a couple of beginners? Did you... Yeah, we went to what's now Mallard on... Yes, Bluebell. On Bluebell. Yes. Then we did the same on Greenacre. Yes, that's the one I've yeah. seen. And then Dan and I also did one, just me and him, on there as well. Wow. That's a fair bit in front of the camera. How did you find that whole 
in front of the camera stuff? Because obviously, like, you've gone from tree surgery to working in an editorial sort of arena to then going on to in front on- of a camera. To be honest, I loved it. Did you? Yeah, because I just... Well, you know you can't shut me up. You can need a baseball bat to shut me up. So <laughs> that's I just natural way. I like people. I like talking. And it's good. I'm a bit of an extrovert. So, just... Did you feel like maybe not in the Discovery series? Because that's, I don't know, that's obviously pressure on yourself because you need to eat and you need to survive. But in terms of like working with Danny and the thinking tackles you did that we just mentioned, did you feel a bit of pressure in terms of a fishing sense there? Mm. No, no, because uh, a I had confidence in me, yeah. Um, and the whole point of it, your all of those things, it's not about the catching; it's about the showing. Mm-hmm. And you have to, in my opinion, you have to have some reality of well, that that particular one, the one on Oxley, Dan battered me. I think I. I I don't even remember catching on that particular one. It just didn't work. Mm. Um, but the point is, everything that we did was valid. So the whole point was you've shown somebody how to method feed a fish and do it because that particular moment was wrong. I mean, it's still a great method. I, I, it's amazing that you don't see more people use the method because it's brilliant. It's a no fuss PVA bag. I was going to say it's easier than a solid bag. Yeah, it's a no no fuss. Fine if you've got to cast a million miles, mm. but um, so no didn't worry me. But I like I like relaying information. So the actual telling and the explanation bit suited me. I like to go with well, this is how you do it. This is what makes it easier. This is how these bits fit together. I like doing that bit, which was I suppose an offshoot of editorial stuff because yeah. angling times as it progressed went from being a newspaper to being a magazine ish through its various phases. We be, more than anything, we were how to towards the end. Yeah. Um, and they, they still are. I mean, there's still great publications. I still buy angling times now because a, a lot of my friends still work on it, and it's angling times. Yeah. 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 Yeah, simple as that. Yeah, it's an institution, isn't it? I think for a generation, definitely. I think nowadays when you look at everything else that's available information-wise with social media and, and the sort of immediacy of it being in front of you on a phone, but our generation, definitely, mate. I dread to think how many copies of angling times I've bought throughout the course of my life. It'd be frightening. But as you say, like, yeah, definitely an institution. Filming wise, you've obviously got your finger tackle stuff. Carp crew as well, wasn't it? I did a couple of bits. A couple of them, didn't you? Did a couple of bits with Kev on Carp crew. They were on the Neen. Oh, yes. Um, I did Redmire one with Lockie. Oh, I haven't seen that. Redmire <laughs> with Lockie? Yeah. That's got to be up there with one of the very <laughs> best, hasn't it? Uh, I can't remember. Aaron had. Remember Aaron, who used to work with Lockie? Yes. He had, oh, was it Lockie? One of them, sorry, I might have done Lockie a disservice. One of them had Raspberry. No. Yeah. And I think Joe Wright came in and talked about having Raspberry from Carpology as well. Yeah. What a carp. And then I had the big common. Gee, when, what was this on Carp Crew? No, this was this was Lockie, uh, a, a solar tackle one for uh, just about Red Mine. Oh, I need to troll through YouTube and, the, and they that we sort of did it over two two sessions because there wasn't enough the first time around. Mate, I need to troll for a YouTube. But uh, no, that was quite that was quite funny. So, but I enjoyed it, and inadvertently because of the way modern media went, we then went from papers yeah to doing tackle tests and things like that because we'd all got websites. But at that point. And your online presence was king, so I morphed mm. into that, and I was the poor version of you going round a Nash trade show, going, "And this is this, and this is that." And you were never a poor version. And, and honestly, mate, I always laugh. It, I always laugh. I think uh, you do it so slickly, and uh, I just look back at some of the stuff I do, and it's like, 
It's a lot of editing with me, mate. You're straight off the cuff. (laughs) Before we go to digital and that side of stuff and that transition, obviously you worked with the great and good, not discrediting your own angling ability, of the carp world, the big names, you Terry Hearns, the likes of. All of them. All of them. And you spent time, like that time on the bank with them when you're out out writing a feature or pinning together whatever piece you're doing is... I mean, you can't, I get it here when I'm on the sofa with people like yourselves. You learn from that experience. That time is invaluable. For you, throughout the course of that time, what what are the ones that really sort of resonate with you? Whether they be through captures, whether they be through just learning things or the individual? Um, Well, working with Tal is a a pleasure because he is a really nice man. Mm. He is just a really, really nice man have a lot of things in common. You know, he does a lot of shooting and he's very hunting orientated because his dad's a very big air rifle shooter. Yeah, I've heard that. Um, he likes his cooking, eats venison and pheasant and all sorts of rabbit. He's, he's very in that ilk, so we have that quite a similar background. There a lot of things in common. Terry is also a great all-round angler. Nobody sees it. He catches massive dace trotting. He catches perch. He does all sorts of things. It would not matter, I swear blind, if you put Terry on a seat box yeah. and set him off. I'm sure, because I think it's just inherent in his genes, he's a good angler. And you look at how he's, he's a phenomenon as well, because he has grown as a person his photography skills are massive his self-filming skills are really good he presents brilliantly mm. there's, there's no such thing as a crap tell film is there no you just you, you're riveted to your seat in awe going oh my but lucky um worked with him for a uh, a long, 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 long time. In fact, my crowning, my proudest moment in any of this is I've got a thank you in the front of one of Tell's books. Me and little Rich Wilby have got a, got a thank you. Jeez. And I still I still show that to people. You've made it, <laughs> yeah, it, Honestly. It's, Which book? <sighs> I think it's still searching. Yeah, the second one. Yeah. It's still searching because that's when that's when me and Rich worked together because that was the UK Carp days. That's it, UK Carps, the magazine yeah, yeah, inside yeah, it, yeah, isn't it? Inside yeah. of Anglin Times. Yeah. So that was then, but it ah, Danny Fairbrass, Lockie, Lockie's a Lockie's become a lifelong friend. Legend, mate. Yeah, but you know, Lockie was so kind to me and took me to so many places and opened my eyes up to the God, we had so many adventures abroad, going all over the place, doing random trips, just all sorts, just very, very funny. And such, again, a great friend and a nice man. What that, an incredible bloke to explore, like, abroad cart fishing oh, with. We, well, when Lockie, Lockie's first trip to Rainbow was my first trip to Rainbow. Jesus, mate. And we went with a guy called Andy Wiggins, and we got directions to the lake to meet a couple of Dutch friends of Lockie's with the directions written on a fag packet. (laughs) Straight up, I'm not... Did you get there? Yeah. (laughs) We passed the entrance about 20 times, driving backwards because we didn't know exactly where it was. And it was was on a Friday night in... It was the first week in December, a Friday night, and it was... In December? (laughs) <laughs> is me thinking you stumped for May or something beautiful? No, 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 no. Oh, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, no. So, mate. Brody, fishing trip. When are you going to pick, Brody? Oh, well, let's just go when it's going to be minus seven, shall we? <laughs> it wasn't quite that bad, but it was cold. Uh, so I got that opportunity through Lockie. Uh, we went and fished some random lake in Hungary, thanks to Lockie, which was... Even more hilarious. That's a story. That is a story in its own right. <laughs> what I, happened there? Well, 
Mark, he's phoned me up as he, he did. And I'm, I was at work and he's gone, you're all right, Brody? Yeah. Any old days left? Yeah. Want to go somewhere? Yeah. See you at my house Thursday night. Cool. That was that. So That's off, it. Off a toddled. Went down. Walked in. Hey, up, mate. How are you? Want beer? Yeah, yeah. And on his kitchen table, no word of a lie, was a... Remember the big road maps of Europe? Yeah. The softback ones that you got for one ninety nine with two gallons of Esso or whatever it was. And he got it open on the page that's Europe. <laughs> right? <laughs> and there's a highlighted line, green line, going from Dartford to somewhere south of Balaton. No, 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 yeah? no, no, no. Right. And I went, we're going to Hungary then? He said, yeah. We left his house at five o'clock Friday morning and we got to the Austrian-Hungarian border at 11 o'clock that night. That is going. <laughs> and we, were, we got stuck in Antwerp. We got, you name it. Uh, I think I drove for a bit, but I think I scared Lockie so much that he said, no, never again. Stevie Wonder can drive better than you. Um, yeah, and we just arrived at this bizarre lake. Um, again, it took us another day to get there. Oh. It was raining. We got out, and I'm put. Rock, Lockie sat in the boat. We've got the echo sound, and I'm pushing it out in wellies, expecting to push it out and then jump in when it gets deep. I was 150 meters out <laughs> in a pair of welly in a pair of wellies, and still oh, that's dreadful, and, mate. And still pushing. Oh no! And we went round this lake. So the two the, the, the two Hungarian guys. It was a tackle tackle shop owner. They had gone to this beautiful shed on stilts, one end of the lake. Right. And we've got garden sheds on stilts all all the way round the edge of this lake. There was no land. Everything was on stilts. And we eventually found some water that was three foot deep. That was the deepest bit we found at three this foot. at this point. And it's going dark at this point. Oh, no. So we find this shed on stilts. And because the water level's down, when we pull up on the boat, the platform's like, here. I know I'm a short ass, but it was still here. It was hell of a way up. <laughs> on your nose. Yeah. So I'm... Climb up, check it. Yeah, this one's solid, Lucky. Right, let's see what the one's like next door. No floor in it. No floor in the shed. So we ended up in this shed for the first night. Lucky puts his bed chair in, puts the foot down. So if you imagine a normal six foot by four foot garden shed. Yeah. Right? That sort of size. He puts his bed chair in. He folded the foot end down so it was flush with the wall. Mm. And then he folded his head end back and it went dunk at 45 degrees. Because So I put my bed chair in, <laughs> did that, and he went dunk. And then we sat and my legs are here. I'm sat like that. And Lucky sat here and his knees are here. And we're like looking. And it was like, oh. That is... Uh, Party friendly, yeah, right? and then it, yeah, it was a great time. We caught lucky, of course, caught all the big ones. Uh, we caught stacks of fish, uh, nothing even remotely to write home about. I think the biggest fish we had was about 31, 32. Massively exciting, huge adventure, and just so random. And we ended up at fishing like ridiculous ranges and this was pre-rainbow so we were fishing ridiculous ranges and it was when i learned about braid it was when i learned about having everything in the boat with you and going out to the fish playing the fish and if it's small unhooking it safely and putting it back and then Mm. dropping your rig back just to save time and effort because we were fishing at about 300 yards three foot (laughs) Oh, it was three foot. Unbelievable. But that, oh, but it gets better. When we go down and visit our guests, well, we're their guests, sorry. Oh, no. 
What they've they got? Oh, they've got eight to ten foot. They've got a log burner in their shed and yeah. eight to, eight foot off the rod tip. Yeah, Perfect. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like theirs was like the Savoy. Ours was a tent. <laughs> what was Rainbow like for the first time with Lockie? Scary. So we went on and we arrived in the dark about eleven o'clock at night. Wow. Uh basically the three of us um put bed chairs up in the clubhouse and had a kit. Woke up in the in the morning. It it was change over day. Pascal was there. Everything was good. Lockie's Dutch mates had come round and Paul Hunt was on with yeah. with one of his trips. Yeah, yeah. So they're dealing in the pack up. So I went round. I was fishing on my own. So when Paul Hunt's lot had gone, mm. there was me, Lockie, and Andy, and the two Dutch lads over on the far side. That was that was a, that was who was on the lake. Jeez. Uh, unfortunately, halfway through the first week, the Dutch lads had to go home when I got some family things. So there was me, and I'd come in Lockie's van, so I'd been dropped off with all my pile of rubbish, and that was me. <laughs> that was that was me for the week. I'm just there on Rainbow. And uh, I was in five. Lockie, Lockie and Andy were in uh, 19, and I was in five. And it's a corner, and there's a channel through three to six, a load of woodwork, little islands, right? scary stuff. I'd spoken to the bloke who'd been fishing there who'd had a load of bites. Um, and he just said, all against these little dot islands. And the contours are like this. It'd be, this is a dot <laughs> island. That's three foot deep. This table's a dot island. Your legs are another channel and your chair's another dot island. Jesus. It's all over. Anyway, I've got braid on. I've got braid on the reels. Uh, I'd learnt leaders, and I'd got some new thirty-five pound coated hoop link. So all that was put on. Rode the bait out, dropped it on this thing, and full of bait. Came back. I'm just sat in this carnage. There's bivvies. There's bait. Yes, there's stuff boots. everywhere. Because everything, everything that's my needed is had to come out the van and be just dropped. So I've got like particle, all sorts back then, all that stuff that you could do. Anyway, about 30 minutes went went by and all of a sudden, beep, beep, beep. And the rod tip just went bang. Oh. And then it just went ding. Oh. Hootlink had snapped in the middle on the take. Jesus. And it was like, shit. We're gonna need <laughs> no, it. Say, it was one of the moments, the little, little fat ginger man sat in the like desolation with tackle everywhere, looking at a broken oak link going, shit. I've got nothing left. <laughs> what, what am I going to do now? And I ended up tying the hoot link out of my leader material. Yeah. And then I've got all problems because I don't know what parcel string I was using for a leader, but it, I'm having to like tease it through the aisle because it wouldn't go through because it was too thick. Yeah. Then I, I think the next take straightened the hook. I think the hook link survived and the next take actually straightened the, the hook on the take. <laughs> on right? the take? On the take. So you're just getting an absolute whack and then nothing. Oh, yeah. Rod, you just go around absolutely horseshoe You're not shit. even lifting into it. No. And then, oh, bang. depressing, mate. So, uh, so, oh, mate. And then, again, that was another journey because we were so out of the depths. Mm. You came back with more questions than answers, and that was the first trip. I, I, I did very well. I think Lockie and Andy both had a 50, if memory serves. Don't yeah. think they had many. I don't think they had many fish, but they both had a 50. And I can remember I was proper jealous. Like before, oh, yeah. oh man, I was so bad. I hadn't, had a, I hadn't caught a 50 at that point. and was absolutely gutted. Yeah. Why, why, why? Did... God loves a ginger. <laughs> but, 
<laughs> so, but I, I I was really lucky. I think I had seventeen fish to forty three or forty four. Oh, that's good going. And it was really, I, I, it was brilliant because the fish started on the left in the snags, and then I lost them. And it, it, the weather changed. It was really hot and sunny, and then it went freezing cold and misty. Okay. Flat calm, typical November, December, flat calm yeah, morning. Yeah, just yeah. Fog, fog never cleared, horrible. And, I'm, and when you're on your own in winter, you have to be quite disciplined, don't you? Otherwise, y- your organisation in the bivvy goes, goes tits up. Uh, so you end up going to bed at half past four and then waking up at midnight and... Yeah. Sat, yeah, you have to. So I'm sitting up at night reading a book by candlelight, just and I'm basically like fishing to the clock. Yeah, and it was cool. Anyway, one night I'm just and in the distance, I badoosh, badoosh, like a little meerkat, then out, and I'm stood there, and I'm just thinking. Not going to jump now, are they? Not going to jump. Badush, another one went. And I got it, and it was over here in the open water, like almost looking from five, looking towards where the clubhouse is. Right. And then there's another one, and then the more I'm looking, and I got my angle right, I could actually see ripples. So I walked round, and, uh, and quite literally walked round and lined it all up, and it was in, it was in front of what was the old peg three. That's they were dug one two three, they, were, they were all dug but they weren't actually ever used, right? So I lined it all up. Following day, went out. Echo sounder, all the rest, and it was a hump. And it was I've gone out from me, and I'm going, oh dear, it's gone sort of off the edge, and it's gone sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, twenty, and I'm thinking, Ooh. Mm, yeah, and I'm going, and I'm getting so close to the bank. I'm thinking, nah. Nah, I'm I'm not up. I'm not going to be confident fishing for them down there. Yeah, and all of a sudden, this big plateau appeared with ten foot of water on top of it. Bosh, that'll do nicely. Yeah, exactly. and I and I put two rods on it. I had one in the tree line somewhere and one up the channel. That night, both rods went. Following night, three rods on it. Three rods went. Yep. <laughs> Following night, four rods on it. <laughs> and, a, and a court, and it was really good, and it was just, again, sort of fairy tale stuff that I was catching. So you're, you're, you're captivated by it, aren't you? You're, dri- you're, dr- you're driven. Yeah, of course. When you're catching your fish well. Yeah. When nothing's happening, there's nothing to alter, is there? There's nothing to tweak. There's nothing to fine tune. Yeah. Then it's gut and experience. That's when gut and experience comes in. And anyway, I was lucky. I was catching a few. And we did it. Lockie obviously became obsessed with the place and was going back all the time. Mm. I got asked again. And then the next time I went... I fished on the island with Aaron, who used to manage all the the day to day things. So we were more so because Lockie had been back. I'd been there. We'd we'd learnt about bigger leads. We'd look, so leader materials, leads, hooks, hook links, more solid setups, better indicate. It was this huge learning yeah, curve. Of course, and it's a completely unique style of fishing, isn't it? And it carried on. And the great thing was that at that time, there were so many good anglers being drawn to Rainbow yeah. that lots of great things came out of that as well. Not just not just us. There was, there was loads of guys doing different things. And some great bits of tackle came out of it. And the European guys, they were great. They were sourcing different stuff that we, we were coming across. Of course. So we were seeing braids that we'd never seen before. We've seen hooks that we'd never seen before. 
and it was it, it was a it was great, and it, it it's a great place to fish. It's like for me, it's like going home. Yeah, I'm happy when I'm there. I like meeting the people because a lot of the time it's very rare you go to Rainbow when there's not somebody that you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Already on there. Yeah. So it's really nice, and Pascal and his family, they are superb. I mean, Pascal can't do enough for you. That his boys can't. Nadine, it's just to me. If somebody said to me, "You can only ever go carp fishing in one place," it would be Rainbow. Would it? Yeah. People say, I think. Like they they're scared to almost go because they get rainbow fever and then they can't go back to the normalities of whatever fishing is over here. Do but, you know what I mean? Yeah, but the br- the the brutality yeah. of it has gone for me. It's the fact that I physically like the place and like the people right. and I've made some great friends and I I enjoy the adventure because every every trip to Rainbow is going to chuck something off. There's there's, there's all. The, the stories are endless. You could write a book just about Rainbow because there's always, you don't travel all that way and all that way back again and fishing like you do in boats and all the rest of it without there being an episode somewhere. What's the best episode that you can think of? Uh, be- being accused of stealing a car. Being accused of stealing a car? Well, technically we did steal a car, but we didn't know. <laughs> you just, <laughs> this will do. No. We were driving back, uh, and it was that trip. It was the first trip. Was it? We're driving back, and at the time, we, we drive a different way now, but at the time, we were going around the periphery in yeah, Paris. Yeah. We've gone around that, so we're on the final stage. We are blasting towards Calais. All systems are go. And then the van goes, Ugh! and breaks down. Six o'clock, December. <laughs> so we phone up, and guy comes and picks picks the van up, which is full of three sets of fishing gear. Yeah, all your gear, my camera bag, all sorts of shit. I think probably a laptop as well, or just all sorts. Takes us to this holding pen points to the hotel across the road and says, we'll be with you Monday, basically. Jeez. And we're like, we're not having this. So we get a taxi back to Charles de Gaulle Airport. Yeah. Get a hire car and then take the hire car back. So we're now doing this back over ourselves several times. And then we drive back to the tunnel, which is now shut Right. In the middle of all this, Lockie's phone's packed up. Oh, mate. So Lockie's on my phone, you know, sorting all the breakdown stuff out. Yeah. So then we'd go from the tunnel to Belgium and get on a commercial. I can't remember whether we went to Ostend or what. I think it was Ostend we went to. Don't quote me on that because I can't remember. I think it was Ostend. And we get at two o'clock in the morning, we get onto uh, a commercial, a lorry driver's oh, boat. But we, get, but we get on, go across, get off the other end. I drive to Lockheed's, pick my motor up. This is all in this hire car? Yeah. And I drive home. Monday morning comes. And I'm sat at Hangling Times, phone rings. Mr. Locke? I said, no, no, it's Steve Broad. Oh, where's Mr. Locke? I said, well, I was away with him at the weekend. There was a bit of confusion. Did he? he says, oh, my name's, she was obviously French, a very, very good English. And she said, uh, my name's whatever. Um, we're, just, we're just trying to uh, locate where our... Hire car is. I said, well, it's probably with Mr. Locke. And she says, oh, is Mr. Locke still in France? I said, no, Mr. Locke's in Dartford. And it was, sacre bleu. Oh, no. The car's, the car's not in France. The, the car's in the UK. Well, we shouldn't have let, nobody told us we shouldn't have taken it out of the country. 
So we got the car. So the car was parked on Lockie's drive. So she then phoned. I I got away with it then. Yeah, I, just I, give it to Lockie. Yeah, I'm well no, 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 no. I've got away with it then. So poor old Lockie's got. Lockie's having this conversation again, oh, no. and he's going, "Where's the car? Well, I'm looking at it now. Now I'm in Dartford, love. Dartford, London." And she's going, the car is in London, yes. Oh! So he's going, love, we've got a Ford Fiesta. You've got a brand new VW Transporter with about 20 grand's worth of fishing tackle in. Yeah, you're quids in. Yes, you're thinking you're all done to. <laughs> so when he goes to pick the car up, it was like a, it was like a scene from Check, Checkpoint Charlie. Did you go with him? No, this is... Oh, this, no. So this is all Lucky telling me. So he had to... Take the hire car down to the ferry. Yep. Get on the ferry. Take the hire car over to France to then do the exchange for his van to be then pushed onto the ferry because it was still knackered. For him to then arrive back, for it to be towed off, then wait for the AA to come because you're all in the custom zones. Oh, mate. So it was like... You know, a spy swap at Checkpoint Charlie. Oh, you've got to wait here for 10 minutes. They're coming back. Oh, so. That sounds aggy as aggy can be. <laughs> did he get did he get all your tackle back? <laughs> yeah, about, about two weeks later or Jeez. whatever it was. So, yeah. So that is a fairly. That ty- is some day, mate. That is a fairly typical rainbow story. <laughs> what about other, obviously? There's great memories there with with Tell, with Lockie. Any others? Any other anglers that were in and around that time that you that you work with? There's all sorts. I can remember doing stuff with Basie about bait and his fishing. Mm. God, we did quite a bit down at Fendrake with Basie. Um, there's lo- there's loads. Of- you meet you tended to meet guys that there's a guy called Darren Belton who's Kent Kent yeah, yeah, based yeah. angler. Again, such a quiet, lovely piece. God, I'd like to be twenty fish behind him. Never mind just what he's caught some proper lumps. Yeah. And there's there's loads of good ones out there. And what what do you think sets them apart? Because you're not. A- you're not at the age there where realistically there's massive numbers of anglers that can do it for a living, produce what was being produced, and you were very much there to sort of coordinate and articulate all that. Why do you think those anglers were, not stood the test of time, that's not the right thing to say, but those anglers were so good and so successful. What, were there any key sort of similarities that they all had, or were they all uh, individual? Uh, they're all driven. Right. They are all driven souls. And that might show itself on the fact that if you're really, really driven, you end up with Nash Tackle mm. or Corda or Solar or a myriad of other great companies that have all got fishing driven people. But if you haven't had done that as a business sense, there's also people that are driven in fishing. And are, are obsessed. You meet him all the time. The guy that will drive from wherever he lives in the country yeah. to the lake at midnight to be there listening and going the extra yard and packing up on Sunday night at nine o'clock at night in the dark to get home and just get enough sleep before he starts work again Monday morning. There's those driven anglers as well. The ones that go and attack the big inland seas. For the one prize, not the go to the ready-made cart water where we get action, which are great, great for your ego. I love it. It makes a, it's nice. We like catching fish. Yeah. But the guys I look up to are the guys that are cutting their own path and doing their own thing. And it might not necessarily be the size of the fish that they're going going for, it's the hunt. Mm. Is that they have a target, that's a nice fish you want to catch, but it's the hunt that sets them alight. It's the problem-solving exercise that sets them alight. It's the making the decisions. In fact, it's the fact that it's absolutely rock hard, which makes them tick. Yeah. Because they like to, 
play prove the odds wrong. The harder the better. Because they're driven people. Yeah. They are driven people. And you come across them all the time. It doesn't matter that it's cart fishing. They're exactly the same people of any sport, any branch of fishing, whether it be I've I know a, a fly international guy called John Horsey. He's a dri- he, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a driven angler. Chew, John, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely driven. Uh, as we're speaking, I think he's in the Bahamas now, Jamie Git. Casting uh, a fly rod, though, I bet. Yeah, oh, God, yeah, it'll be something exotic. Match anglers, you talk to guys like Steve Ringer. Now, yeah. Steve Ringer is a massively interesting bloke. Wait, so Steve's got, not only could he put you a great bag of silverfish together. Yeah. But he's actually, he's the middleman now. He's of, crossed over, hasn't he? Yeah, from our carp techniques and now part of carp fishing, as in yeah. carp fishing. And those are driven individuals, and there's lots of them. There isn't just one or two, there's lots of them. But you tend not to hear about them. You hear the people that shout the loudest. Yes. And most of these guys don't want to stick their head up the parapet. We say it all the time. There's those lads on your syndicate that go about that will catch more fish than anybody else, but they're not the ones yeah. you see necessarily on YouTube or on whatever else. They just go about their business. and they're, But there is also within that an element of something that they do and I think, I'm trying to think, draw parallels to sort of recent podcasts, Wayne Barrett, Weekender, can't really compare him to anybody else that works in fishing because they get time and they get to go yeah. and fish wherever. Weekend angler. But the decision-making that man makes of how to attack a venue means that he gets rewards time and time again because it's just ridiculous. And there are definitely things that certain anglers do that might be them that is whatever it may be, whether it be baiting, whether it be watercraft, whatever it is. That, that sort of sets them apart. But like you're saying, there's underpinning fundamental values, like just being mad enough to go out there and do it in the first place. Well, it, it, you're exactly right. And it, it's amazing. So right here, you've got Ollie and Alan mm. doing their stuff. Not only are they both very driven and talented individuals, they have absolute faith in what they're doing yeah and that's another killer there's no doubt then they're confident in their abilities if you're confident in your ability you're 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 approaching everything in a positive way so therefore it works if you're having doubts about things you can't settle you're changing things and it's not right when you go in with a pod- positive outlook, it works. You, know, you look at this, you look at the stuff that Alan and Ollie do. Yeah, 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 totally. I would be pooing my pants on some of the waters they go to and be stood there going, uh, don't know what to do, don't know what to do. Yeah. And they just get on with it because they have that inbuilt thing that they know. They actually know what to do somehow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I get it completely. It's so, it's so hard to quantify. But it's the thing, it's the, it's the sort of key thing that is so, not unique, but it's what separates those anglers, doesn't it? No, it is, and that's why you can't bottle it, you can't put your finger on it, no. because it's very, it's an intangible thing. Yeah, 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 but yeah totally. You, but you can see, you can recognise it, because you can put 10 people up in the line and go, He's got it, he's got it, she's got it, he's got it, she's got it. But try and explain what it is. Yeah, 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 it's not not an easy thing to do. What about the converse, though? What about, what about going out and things haven't gone right? I know you're trying to achieve an article at most of these times, and it's not necessarily video content, that's separate. But when you're going out there and you're working with new people within the industry that you haven't had any experience of working with, and it and it may be not going right. How has that been in terms of... Because that's a key part of the job as well, isn't it? It doesn't happen all the time. You're dealing with fish. They're wild animals, isn't they? Yeah, but you've got... We know that bit, and I've been around long enough to know that. I was lucky. I'd got Mick Rouse, Lloyd Rogers, so many, two brilliant photographers... Yeah. ...that taught me how to take off decent... Snap, not a, not a patch on what they can do. Um, brilliant writers, you know, Kev, Richley, uh, 
Steve Fitzpatrick. Uh, there was a guy called Steve Partner who was a very, very good writer. Um, and it, it, when surrounded by good people, you a little bit rubs off. Well, it should rub off. So, again, that's different people. Mm. I'm always inquisitive, so always wanted to learn. So I, I had a good base for it all. And then when you go, a feature is a little bit like, like what we're doing here. We've got a skeleton of where we're going. Yeah. That randomly morphs because natural conversation changes and you wander off somewhere else. And, you know, that's great. That's the natural joy of uh, two people talking. Yeah. It should be like a conversation down the pub or in a bivy in the rain. Yeah. Yeah, that should be what it's about because it's it's you talking to your mate for everybody else to hear. Yeah. And having a laugh and telling the rough with the smooth. And I always thought that when you were doing a feature, the journey from A to B was a little bit like that journey because it could all go swimmingly and you set out to do this but it, and it worked. You caught a big fish, you've got your action shot, you've got everything – Everything's just fallen into place. Carp gods have gone. Nice yeah. one, Brody. And you're driving back around the M25 going, yes. Or it is shit. Yeah. And everything's gone wrong. You've forgotten a lens. You've only got one memory card. It's raining. There hasn't been a fish caught for 27 years. The bloke's got the ump because his missus has left him or the lady with boyfriend's playing up and she's not happy either. Oh, my God. So you play by ear mm-hmm. and then you adapt and survive. So the creative bit from any good journalist doing what we do is you adapt and survive and bend it into your way so you've you got... You get something out of so it. So you get something out of it, <laughs> yeah. regardless of what happens. Because yeah. I'm sure you're not going to come back to Uncle Kevin, are you, and go... Oh, I've, I've just had a week in France, Kev, and we've got fuck all. <laughs> we've got no filming, nothing. Yeah. That'd go down well, would it? Down really well. <laughs> but no, true, I get what you mean. But it's a skill, that in its sense, and you, you that I don't think you necessarily... But the guy, the guys have done it, like you said, I mean, you mentioned Joe Wright, there's Mark Coulson, who was, yeah. a, who was a, another lovely chap and great editor, you know, these guys were good at what they did or do sometimes in some cases, a bit of both. Mm-hmm. Um, and the good, at what, and the reason why they're still there is because they can do that. Yeah. That, that's 100%, 100%. that's it. And that's why a lot of them have moved because obviously with the death ongoing, slow demise of the magazine, you find most of those guys in jobs with tackle manufacturers. Yeah. Now? Yeah. You know, you've got Gary Newman, who's a phenomenal journalist who now does his stuff for Cordra. Yeah, he yeah. does, yeah. And that's because Gal is good at what he does. He's a yeah. very, very, very talented man. And a very, I mean, pictures are awesome. He's so methodical. He's so bang on. Uh, and that's why these got Little Rich did it when Rich came from UK Carp and then came here and went on to do his own stuff. There's a few. There's a, there's a few out there you yeah. know, that, that you see. And fair play to them. The reason why they've done it is because they've got that little spark to... Make it happen. Yeah, too well, right. create a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Which is what you're doing with this. Yeah. Not at all, mate. <laughs> so, this is easy work. Yeah. So that's what you do. Yeah. For you, what the best capture over that course of time? Not personally by yourself, but when you're out on features. Oh, it's a tough one because I've been to places. I photographed a record chub. Yeah. Uh, that was when... Um, oh, Rob Tuff had it out of Mercer's. 
and then Andy Maker had the same fish, I think. Uh, Maker, so I got a ticket on that. Mercers at the for that time. chirp. No, I was caught fishing it. Well, yeah, right there, dudes. <laughs> so he had a mad spell of doing massive chub and massive roach. So yeah, you remember those, but I don't know. Sometimes it's just the joy of seeing somebody catch something. Yeah, especially when I can remember going to. There was we had a fishing event um, in memory of Kev Green. Yeah, and we had. A little get together. Um, again, a lifelong friend of his, Brian Scoyles, and Brian's family were huge friends. Yeah, of, of Kev's. course. Yeah. So everybody was there, and Tell was there as well. And again, I watched him catch a 15 pound common on an overdep zig on somewhere where you'd never expect to see Tell fishing. Yeah. With a load of people around, just celebrating a nice guy's existence in the world and recognise what he'd done. And that was that was quite nice and sort of emotional that you go, all these people are here for that person. And that's a great show of respect. Mm. Uh, very soon when Ian McMillan passed away, there was another one that was so, just a, a lovely, a lovely man. Lovely man. Very well liked. Very funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, so you, yeah, you do. Rem- I remember lots of things. Uh, I'm I'm impressed because I've seen forty pound pike on the bank and uh, eighteen pound bream, uh, all sorts of things, and you just think that's monstrous. They're so big, you're actually don't quite know what you're looking at. Yeah. And, pa- and Pike especially. You seen a 40-pounder? I've seen three now. Jesus. Yeah, that didn't even seem Sorry. real. Uh, two 40-pounders and a 39-14. That's bad weighing. <laughs> <laughs> or good weighing. Uh, it, it, just exciting. And, and guys, when you are having that awful day in... January, trying to get a feature together that's actually going to hit the shelves in probably May. Mm. And you're trying to do things to be time correct when it's just not... But then you do it. And it's... You know what it's like? Quarter past four, and you've done as many rig shots as you can do, as many casted shots as you could do, (laughs) and many bloke wearing Polaroid glasses up a tree <laughs> picture that you could do. Yeah. Random man pointing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you're thinking, nah, this is gone, this is gone. And then beep, 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 an 11-pound mirror saves the day. And that, at that present moment in time, is the best fish you have oh, ever no. seen in your entire life. You have never been so... That fish, I'll marry it. I'll take it away to Barbados for a holiday because that fish, you made it. And it brings that moment. And fishing is about the moment. I 100% think that. But when you're working in it, and I can only speak from personal appearance, that, that when it's not your own fishing and you're doing it for a job... And as you say, you're at that time of the year where you know it's going to be difficult. You might be on a new event, whatever the the constraints are. I think the highs are that much higher, yeah. But the lows, conversely, are that much lower because we're all we all treat ourselves under pressure because we have a pressure to yeah. succeed, yeah. And we also have a. I always felt when I was doing it that I had an obligation. Yeah, yeah, totally. as well, totally to present something for other people to digest and for them to get benefit from it. And I enjoyed doing that. Mm. I enjoyed the high two stuff. I I said to you uh, when we were doing the build up to this and just uh, checking we were going in the right direction. I'm actually a fishing tackle nerd. Yeah, You did say this. You love it, didn't you? Yeah. And I used to love knowing where things had 
come from and how they developed into that and how they'd grown. And so that rod turned into that rod, turned into that rod, but created this rod. Mm. Uh, Real, all sorts of things. And it was exciting for me that when somebody did reinvent the wheel, you'd go, fair play, that's awesome. Never seen anything like it. Brilliant. And then you see the other things where genuinely finding a hundred quid rod at two hundred quid bivy, whatever it happened to be, doesn't matter what it is, that was genuinely good and genuinely good value for money. Yeah. Because let's be right, fishing tackle can either be as expensive as gold <laughs> or cheap as chips. Mm. We all aspire to the top, but that's not the reality of the buying market, is it? No. And it's good. If we make fishing too elitist, there'll be no no more anglers because you'll price anybody coming through out of the market. You'd almost get to a point where it's sort of Formula One-esque, where unless you're the prodigy of a millionaire... It's not happening. It's not happening. Yeah. You ain't going to be... A racing car driver. Yeah. You're just not. And at the rate that we're going with, you know, angling clubs, far, you know, disappearing and accessible. Great. We've we've got loads of great waters. But how many are truly accessible? When you turn around and go, I can take you to some Bluebell Lakes, one of the best day ticket complexes in the country, bar none, because of the size of fish, everything but not exactly cheap. Mm. If you're 15 years old, you've got to do some serious blagging to get yourself two or three down, days down there and have all your nice yeah, kit, kit and all. Else. Yeah. That's expensive. And we're doing the groundwork, trying to keep, encourage people, doing the stuff that's on TV, mainstream TV now, podcasts, the things that the industry is doing as a whole, there's more lady anglers than ever, which is brilliant. Yeah. Massively accepted, which is about bloody time. So we're doing all this hard work, but it'll all come to naught if nobody can afford to go fishing. No, you're right. For you, that 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 tackle element, the you talked about reinventing the the wheel. As your sort of Work went on, the years passed. With regards to tackle, things that really sort of were a massive nerdy point and you sort of were like, that's mega. What were those standout items that came around and about? Because there's not, and we said this when we were talking before, like you've already talked back to, there's not there's not an abundance of absolute game changers, is there? No, but there's, there's stupid things that you get, like uh, you'll see a, a particular make of, bank stick that actually works mm. as an example and that's a reasonable price doesn't weigh the same same as uh you know two pounds of lead and it's a practical and fun- functioning thing and it's nothing uh a spawn yeah look at the look at the all conquering spawn you know and all the derivatives that have come from it now because yeah. it was that design principle that they got but we all went from the empty tube that upends itself with a buoyant nose cone and tipped it out to releasing on impact. Mm. Fair play. Yeah. Quality of some of the items that you get, quality of hooks, quality of hook links, reel lines, you know, all things, tapered reel lines. Brilliant. Just brilliant. Just made life so much easier. Um. You you have to look for the the magic in the little in the little bits. Mm. Uh, I, I I always had a a favourite item of tackle that was actually one of one of Nash's, uh, and I don't. So it was the little table, right? And it had got a side drawer built in, like a big deep side drawer, only like that, and then a slot for a small tackle box. That went in. I should know that, really. Uh, yeah, and and you just had a little catch that kept the tackle box in there. So you folded the legs up. These two carrying bits were ensconced in f- 
for argument's sake, something that was this big. I can't even, can't even remember what it was called like that. It was mega. For me, I just used to chuck it in the mat, get, get there, go bump, bump, bump with the legs, tackle box out, baiting needles there, sound. It was the perfect type of tackle for me. And then he discontinued to his heartbroken. <laughs> Yeah, you bought 20 of them before, so you're No, right, I mate. didn't. That was a yeah. point I didn't. I've got, I think I carried on I carried on making them out of various bits, and then I saw one on uh, on, on eBay about, this is the honest truth, about six weeks ago, maybe, maybe two months, I saw one on eBay. I thought, I'll have that. Some bastard beat me to it. Oh. I was absolutely... What did it go for? Pricey or not? No, it went for 35 quid plus P&P. And I was absolutely gutted. You used to have a rummage around about, mate. There probably about 20 of them. Honestly, <laughs> honestly, I was absolutely gutted. Mate. That, 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 I mean, yeah. That, as you say, like, there are items that, I don't know, that are game changers. But in your position, where you are educating an audience, you're talking about tackle, knowing it, to be a tackle nerd is an absolute edge. But also to convey that in a way that people take on mate i'm so sad i loved it yeah i'm so sad i just absolutely loved it i'm looking at a bit of plastic and going oh man that's brilliant (laughs) fair dues mate made for it but the point is it's when you look at these things and i always say this to people when you when you challenge them and you go what's the one item of tackle that you wouldn't be you couldn't. You'd be gutted if you if you hadn't got it. A hook, mate. A hook and a bit of line. Yeah. Well, it, it's amazing what people will say. Because <laughs> if depending on what type of angle you are, somebody will say PVA. Somebody will say this. Yeah. Somebody will yeah say I bet that. you get a few answers. So it's really interesting to see what people. Mm. And normally, it isn't a big item. No. No. True. I like that. Your your role, you talked about there that earlier on before I segued you into France and Lockie and Tao and everybody else. <laughs> we we talked about the change, this sort of switch into sort of digital. Obviously you had T V bits that fed in, but generally that went from written word into sort of more digital video type content, right? Yeah, it's it was the hard thing to do because you have to recognise and be honest. So a magazine is there to make money. Yep. It's a business. So at one point at one time, a magazine was the connection from the manufacturer to the general public. Yeah. That was the connection. Because there was no other connection. There was no no other way of getting that message out. Yeah. yeah. If you were the tackle box in Kent and you've got some something that you wanted to sell, loads of it, you needed to te- let the world know. And the only way to do it was through a magazine. It's very simple. They were the golden years where money and advertising went hand in hand. The magazines flourished, so we had loads of them. There was a place for all of them. And everybody did well. Then we had the onset of the internet and social media and your access to information was massive. Mm. You no longer needed the magazine. So it becomes hard because, yes, you can say, present it online, but how do you make money out of it? Because you have somebody like you mm. doing it for your business or the business you work for. And that's the point. You are now going direct to the customer and yeah. presenting them with ideas and going, this is what we've got. This is how you use it. These are our guys. And you, you give, you're giving, offering the full package of for our business that is trying to sell that information to survive. It's a completely different thing. Yeah, of course it is. It's interesting that now um, the bespoke fishing channels, 
that you pay a subscription for are existing because some of the carp anglers that are out there that, that are work, very hard working, very talented, uh, they're now create they're they're now basically creating their own platform, and of course they're earning a little bit. It's it's almost self perpetuating. The better you present yourself, the more people watch. Yeah. The more you get supported, and it it it's an ongoing thing, and it's interesting, uh, and so impressive because the quality of what has been produced. I mean, I, I look at Joe and Rob and Carpology, and the quality of what they produce still to this day yeah, is fantastic. That is why they're the last one standing in reality. You know, they've got it. Yeah. But, it's a hard game as soon as that web closes in and, and, and that, as you say, the parameters change with social media and that whole influx. For you, on a personal level, obviously you are no longer in position doing what you were doing within the industry. What was that a lead up to that? Do you think was that a prelude to that changing or not? Um, potentially, maybe, maybe it was, and I hadn't realised it was. Uh, but I was just when I finished, I was exhausted. Oh well, yeah, I'd done it so long, and you have had to reinvent the wheel. Okay. Every day. You have had to come up with the de- ideas every day because that is your job. Mm. You can't escape it. That is your job. You have got to create something that's interesting, informative, and entertaining. That's what you've got to do because if you don't do it, nobody buys your product and you're out of a job. So when Carp World was sold and moved on, I'd sort of reached the point where I was happy to step away from it. Now, five, six years later, I miss it. I miss being creative. I miss being part of the family. It's quite strange. So recently I've been to a couple of tackle shows. Okay. Okay. And it's very odd being the wrong side of the stand. Right, right, right. And it's really odd talking to people that haven't seen you for an awfully long time as well because, oh, we thought you were dead. <laughs> you know? well, you, mate, but you did, as you said there, you, you stopped, didn't you? Yeah. There weren't. There wasn't a tail off. There wasn't a a change in sort of what you did. It was you were very influential with regards to the Cartwell publication, all that sort of stuff. When that shifted, it seemed to be you were out of industry and, and that was that. Yeah. I chose to, I chose to walk away. Yeah. And at the time it was the right decision. You know, it was the right decision because I I think I'd sort of been wrung out a little bit. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, Working on the magazines were better than working on the weeklies because at one point you couldn't have more than a week off. Yeah, weeklies are because everything was too tight. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I do a weekly podcast, which is nothing compared to a weekly yeah. sort of magazine, and I know the feeling. It is the wheel, isn't it? You're you're doing it every. There's no there's no leeway. No, because it's the monster that wants continuously feeding. Yeah. It is the beast that never stops. And that's what a magazine is, especially when you're the editor of it. Yeah. The book stops with you. Yeah. You're at a dinner and somebody's got a something that needs re-editing or retyping. You've got to do it, haven't you? Yeah. It's got to be there. Yeah, that's it's, savage. You can't miss your print slot. No. It's got to be done. There, it, there is no, oh, it'll do tomorrow. It has it's to. too late. It has to be done. So I think... All of that in the background going on, stepping away and going, <sighs> yeah, breathing was quite gnarly. And then I probably, well, I did. I took a good, long, hard look at myself and 
there's guys out there doing the stuff they do, like you do, and all the other people like you that are doing the stuff. And to be honest, they were all so good, I almost felt intimidated and thought, well, I can't, I can't compete with that. And didn't. Like I say, coming back to me now, I miss being creative. I miss having interaction with people that do design tackle and things. I mean, I, I used to love having conversations with Alan here yeah. about things. And the strange conversations when it's somebody's showing you something and you go, yeah, but if you just put a loop there, you could have done that. And the look of horror on the face when you say that, and they go, how did I never see that? Yeah. And it, it is things that that's why anything that's designed well is a collaboration of various people because it's that interaction between various people that goes, well, if you take that bit, that bit, and that bit and put them all together, that makes this bit. It's yes, a welder, yeah. That's what it is. So, yeah, I do miss it. I do miss it. I must admit, doing, doing my job, I'm out every single day, quite often wandering around the countryside. What is it? What do you do now, mate? I survey power lines. Yeah, that's right. I remember you saying. It's uh, an outside. So, all good. Yeah, and it, and it is. You, we do a lot of different things. It's never a dull moment. Yeah. Um, you know, you could be organising traffic management one day to speaking to somebody that's got a problem because you want to cut the trees down and they don't want you to. Um, all sorts. Oh, oh, beautiful. Well, my title is project manager. I think you should just cross that out and say dog's body. But that's no, great. I work all over my sort of area. So South Links through to sort of, Donington and down through Northampton and back round through Bedford. So get about a bit. And uh, you still have time for your own angling, don't you? Oh, great. Yeah. I have more time than ever now. Yeah, I like that. And we, it's your fishing rather yeah, than work fishing. Well, we're getting into, I get a bit lazy in the summer because we've got so much daylight. But in the winter, I will fish every day. What? No in, way. In one form or another. I love it, that. Because it's great. I've got the river, I've got the lakes, I've got everything and not very far away. So I can quite literally finish work at four o'clock and go and do a couple of hours. Yeah, the dream. And it's great. And I love it. That's my turning off. That's my turning off bit. That's when I switch off and go, oh, me and the little dog, we just sat there. Just, yeah. Now, fishing wise, mate, we talked about a real sort of, prominent move for you away from the old wilds of the northwest over to peterborough with work and with that there's a few really significant chapters that we've talked about when we're talking about this podcast around venues but around that area pretty local to you was it fair to say that in an angling sense when you move that opened some opportunities in and around a very busy work schedule yeah sort of um because of my friendship with richard lee Yep. Uh, the, when I got to Peterborough, I'd already fished a lot in Peterborough. Com okay. Coming down to visit Rich as a mate, and we'd done little features together, just random stuff. So, yeah, it was quite... It was an eye-opener because I was sort of looking forward to what I'd dipped my toe into. So I knew of the Bluebell complex... Uh, for various reasons, I can. My first time across Tony Bridgefoot's path mm. was a, a Pike Anglers conference, Pike Anglers Club conference, right? And it's when the forty forty pound pike was still alive. No way! And I'm talking to this guy, not realizing <laughs> that in X amount of years. I'd be living in his back garden. That's crazy, <laughs> yeah, isn't it? I'd become like a, a squatter in his in his back garden. Um, so it was exciting because uh, I'd travelled to fish Ferry Meadows, which is right on the edge of Peterborough Town Centre, and I was fishing that for Xander because we didn't have Xander in 
the northwest. Oh. It was way before they'd spread through the canal systems and they were knocking around. So they were new to me and exciting. Um, the river in itself was exciting because, again, we'd only really got the weaver up in the northwest that had got carp in, but it it wasn't anything like. The Nina got this massive history of carp fishing because of the electricity cut. Mm-hmm. You know, and when I first started talking to, I was talking to Mick Rouse. And Mick Rouse's best mate, who's Pete and there's Elliot Simon, they fished it. Yeah, yeah, of course. And they're telling me about it. They're t- I, I, was, I was born when they were fishing it. And it was like, it was like. Jesus, I thought I was old. <laughs> <laughs> Rouse, you'll kill me for saying that. Rouse, you'll kill me. Lloydie will as well. <laughs> um, but it, it was it was so funny that there was this history there of a river that had got carp in, and then you're doing news stories about carp. You know, suddenly you're writing a news story about Joe Bloggs chub fishing has just landed a 40 pound common out of the neem Mad. you know uncle eric was fishing got his favorite his favorite bream hole and he goes and gets a 37 pound mirror and you're thinking jesus what this is all about so that was exciting and then bluebell was always there in the background sort of just hovering bubbling away yeah so it was a bit weird. I got asked by Martin Ford, who at the time was editor of Improve Your Course Fishing. Yeah. No, he wasn't editor. I do apologise. He worked on Improve Your Course Fishing. And he had arranged a feature with Nick Hellier on the Bluebell Com- Complex. Yeah. He couldn't do it for some reason. And he said, oh, can you do it for me? Just do the pictures and things, and I'll catch up with Nick and do the words. Right, so you just had to go and get images? Yeah, and I just, yeah, 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 of course. It's just, so I never met Nick, not really. Uh, I'd come across him, but didn't, hadn't. And anyway, we'd had this weekend together, and Nick was like perpetual motion. Want to be here, want to be there, want to be there, want to yes, be there. Course. Yeah, want to be in the river, want to be in here, that corner. Oh, the wind's over there, go, let's go down there. And it, we ended up, towards the end of the day, um, Kingfisher was fairly quiet. Um, he had found a load of fish in the corner of Bluebell, which is back-to-back with Kingfisher. Yeah. And uh, we were just wandering around, and we he climbed this tree. I was taking some tree shots, so he climbed, he climbed this tree and was looking at it, and he's gone, God, look at all these fish here. And we were on the one of the points at Kingfisher. Right. So I climbed the tree next to him. Oh, the two little spindly ash trees they were, and we were waving around in the top of them, about probably only six, seven foot off the ground, but high enough to look down. And in every hole in the weed, there was a carp. And they were everywhere. This is in Kingfisher, not yeah, like yeah, in Bluebell. Yeah, this is in Kingfisher. So... Nick's gone, I'll fish in there, and I fished in Kingfisher. Uh, I think he had a couple of fish in the night. I lost one. So the so the sort of, yeah, I got unfinished business. Right. So I started half dabbling <laughs> with Kingfisher, but not. I don't know whether I was scared of it or... I kept turning up and just not quite doing it. And then randomly I did a, a, I did a weekend with Fordy again. I think it was a thank you for doing that thing with Nick. Right. And we rocked up on a bank holiday weekend or something, and I just ended up launching a solid PVA bag out the, down this little corridor that I got. Cause, yeah. Yeah, like, was it manically busy then as well? On and off, yeah. on and off. And I had a 20... I think it was 27 common, I think. Well, that was it. Yeah. That was it. Anyway, one day, 
we've done something at 80, for whatever reason there was, I got a load of ground bait, chop worm, maggot, caster, you name it, all left over from doing some photo shoot. So I thought, I'll take no point in wasting it. Yeah. I'll take it, chuck it out. So I'm trying to find somewhere to fish on Kingy, mm-hmm. and I'm walking along what they call the lock bank, walking up to the lock, and I just don't know what made me do it. I've just gone, oh, my God. There was three big commons feeding in 18 inches of water just where so water comes through the lock into a pool yeah. and then the, the river tightens up again. And they were just there in between the cabbages and the bank or just on the flat silt feeding the reds off. Oh. Anyway, ended up setting in the pool, setting up in the pool below the lock and I've sort of, by angling, I can, I can sort of get, there was a hawthorn bush yeah. and they were the other side of this hawthorn bush. So I sneaked through all the nettles and everything and put all this bait in, yeah. Right on the shelf, right underneath this bush. And I'm like, well, it's either going to work or it isn't. And I think unwittingly I'd hit on probably the only way you can avoid catching chub and bream in the knee when using that sort of approach. It's put it in so shallow water, nothing dare eat it apart from a carp. It wasn't, wasn't good planning. I think I just... Got lucky. Stum- was stumbled on it by absolute accident. Anyway, middle of the night, rod goes, and it was a common, and I think it was 28 or 29. Jesus. And it was like, oh, so now I'm torn. I've now got, I've now got a taste for the river. And then there's Kingfisher just waving itself behind me. And it was like, oh. Anyway, so I set off and I had basically that that autumn and then the following summer up, up to about August time of going mad flat out on the river. Really? Yeah, just mad flat out. And it was good then because we were post the first big flood. So the river had had its dose of new fish. Mm. And the thing was, these fish were bloody massive. Yeah, huge. Because they'd all come out of the gravel pits that had been created from the original lot of fish that had been nicked out of the river. (laughs) Anyway, so... I started off doing the normal bits of fishing the following instead of cutting your own path. I followed. I used old information. I got the biggest resource of Angling Times. I was going to say you've got some information. Yeah, but it wasn't the it wasn't the best thing to do. The best thing to do was get off your ass, go for a walk round, and actually find them, mm-hmm. and cut your own path. And as you were doing that, other things came to that. Anyway, I discovered that there was a few areas very underexploited and had some really good cap- captures, which culminated in, um, I'd, I, I, misquote, I misquoted myself, I actually had 7.30s in a night. 7.30s out the river in a night? Yeah. What in the world of, ma- you've completed it? I will never go near another river. Well, you couldn't help it then because there was other big fish coming out. But the problem was, I think in my naivety, it hadn't quite dawned on me that what some of the big fish were that were coming out yeah. with big known fish from places like Bluebell, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ringstead, Stanick, yeah. all of those. So when you've suddenly heard of a 38, 39-pound common, you're not thinking hedges. You're thinking 38, 39 pound river common. Yeah, yeah. Not in a million years in your head are you going. And that fish, hedges, was also with another fish, which was called the quiet one, which was out of ringstead. Yeah, the quiet one out of ringing, yeah. yeah. But I hadn't put two and two together in my naivety at that. It, it, very quickly, the penny dropped. But 
it didn't at first. So I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm fishing for all these uncaught monsters. And the reality is, I wasn't. I was just, the residents had just moved. That was all it was. I see you catching around the river. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it was a very, very, very enjoyable time. Great. It, as anybody who fishes a river, it it's an art form in itself, mm. just because, well, hey, everything in the river wants to eat what you're, what you're putting out. Everything. It doesn't matter. Everything wants to eat what you've got, and you will catch them. The Dean's got tension as well, so you've got tench, bream, chub, chub, you name it. You've got them. Eels, just to add a little bit of interest. Oh, no. So it helped because it taught me loads of things that came on for other places that have fished since and other styles of fishing, but... Big hook baits, rock hard baits, all sorts of things. So it was a very important learning curve. Caught some big fish. Uh, nothing monstrous. I think thirty two was probably my biggest. And this, but this now you, you you say that I'm being a bit down. I was mega chuffed. I was blown away. I mean, that's a massive fishing river. It, regardless of whether it's flooded in or out, but but. But you're talking about people were catching 35s, 36s, 38s, 40s. A 40 of ridiculous. You know, and it was like, God. You know, those fish were there for a time, and now obviously, like anything, some got repatriated. Mm. Some probably ended up as otter food, because that was just at the start of when the otters were beginning to appear. Uh, we have had other floods which tend to push them down and we're not far from the tidal bit yeah. where we are. As the crow flies, it's probably only seven or eight miles. Okay. Uh, and as soon as you get to the dog and doublet, you're basically out to sea, mate. Mm. Uh, so really interesting and and good, but it, I soon realised that it I wasn't quite being the pioneer that I thought I was. It was just... Right time, uh, right place. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it was that. And, uh, but great. Really enjoyed it. Have you, have you, were you baiting areas? Yeah. Or, or were you sight fishing for them? No, baiting. Baiting. We learned baiting. There was a couple of places that you, we had a... Well, going back to UK Cop, we did feature... Because we got to know it, we did features and filming yeah. on the river and caught fish yes because we knew where they lived so natural holding points in that river yeah and we weren't catching monsters but we were catching and catching river carp and doing it well so yeah it was all good i mean i can remember doing uh an opening an opening thing with kev on the river and i basically said yeah meet me there at half past eight in the morning i'll do the night and I'll have some fish for you by the time you get there. And it was quite literally. I think I got two doubles or a single and a double. Mate. Oh, look, mate. River, out of a river, regardless, mate. As you say, I know that there's the timing element. I know that there's what you might feel is not the pioneering, but still you got to catch them. Oh, uh, yeah, it was great. Really enjoyable. And there is guys still there. There's a couple of guys that uh, fish around the Peterborough area and they are still mad keen. And they keep they keep all to low profile, mm. and there's one of them, mate. He's got a little bait company, and he does his own thing, but he is still catching them. Is he? And he's still catching them. And fair play to him. Talk about being against all odds, and this bloke is still catching them. And all of a sudden, he, he chucks a proper curveball in that wobbles your head a bit. Like, oh, here's some old gnarly thirty-seven pounder. You can, what? Where? What have you been through? Where yeah. have you come yeah. from? So, again, there is guys out there doing it. And they are out there doing it. And he's catching. So, yeah, certainly not the stuff you, that people want smashing around everywhere, though, is it? No, no, not at all. But that's some 7.30s in a night. 
Oh, it was mind blowing. I couldn't believe it. But then, of course, you had to keep stum yeah. at the time. You couldn't. You couldn't tell your mum because somebody would have been there and they would have been in somebody's lake by by the following evening. Yeah, yeah. What's that? In the, what's that in the boot of your car, Brody? Nothing. I oh, know. <laughs> yeah, unbelievable, mate. So, so that pretty much ended once you'd, you'd sort of had those those fish. Yeah, I'd, I'd scratch the itch. Yeah, and, yeah. And then it was sort of, oh, hey, up. I think, I think what swung it for me is I went and photographed, because our office was so close mm. to Bluebell. Somebody phoned up one day and went, Brody, can you go down and photograph Benson? Yeah, 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 yeah. Off a toddled. First time I'd seen it in the flesh. Jesus. That was it. It was buggered then. How big was it when you saw it? 50 pound an ounce. That's a massive common, that. And I saw it and it was like, oh. And couldn't really get it out of my head then. So that's when I disappeared onto Kingfisher. And as they say, two and a half years later, of virtually fishing it daily. Did you fish it daily? Not quite, but I was pretty extreme. What were we saying? Five nights a week. Wow. Yeah. All the way through the winter, all the way, just all the time. Hello, Tone. I'm here again. Well, Lynn always says, when, when I go around and see Tony and Lynn, if there's anybody there to listen, she'll always tell the story of when she's come downstairs one day and I'm <laughs> there's a bit of a track record going, I'm, I'm stiffed off naked having a wash in the kitchen. Are you getting naked in front of women yeah, again? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I've been arrested for it now, so it's all right. <laughs> I've to have my time. Yeah, 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 it's part of my rehabilitation talking about it and getting out in the open. <laughs> nice, lovely work. <laughs> but that, that, that sort of fish and... and sight of it but that captured your kingy benson it was a very yeah. much a target and uh yeah it was definitely a target and it was um definitely at the time it wasn't as busy as you see it now it was busy but yeah. wasn't as busy but it was actually busy with the same people predominantly yeah so there was a great camaraderie. There was a lot of friendships went on. I mean, God, I've, I ended up photographing that that fish so many times. I was basically sick of sight of bloody thing. Um, John Cooper, I think he had it three times. Kyle had it twice. And there were so many people that had it. Could I catch it? Most people caught Benson within yeah. within, 20, within 20 fish. Yeah, quick, didn't they? Yeah. I remember yeah, talking to people about it. When so it I think there was me, regulars who were like properly after it. So I think there was me, Rich Morris, who was an El Stowe guy, been around the block a bit, uh, well, around a lot, good angler, Rich, and Lee Birch. Birch, yeah, yeah. And we all carried on, carried on, and it was getting ridiculous. We've gone from 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 fish, and you're thinking... How many fish are in there? Well, this was the weird thing. Well, you get loads of repeats as well, but you get into the point where you're going, Bob from Scunthorpe comes down, hammers his rod wrestling, casts a pop-up out, catches Benson, and you're going, what? Good angling, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. I'll just take a picture of you for you, shall I, Bob? Nice. I'll do take your details again. I'm seven grand in debt and eat your tea bags <laughs> off the floor, Bob. <laughs> and that's and honestly, that's what it was like. And then the, when I f- so I did an entire winter with Lockie on there, uh, and he caught it in the spring. Did you, how was that winter? Dreadful. It was awesome because there was nobody on. It was. We had the place to ourselves 90% of the time. Yeah. It was one of those winters where it was gale force, southerly, ro- low pressure, and absolutely chucked it down Perfect. nonstop. And that was the winter. And it was really funny. Lockie's told the story about it, but I kept, I'd come from work. Lockie would all be set up in his little bivvy, and I'd set up, stick the rods out, Go and see him. We'd order a takeaway, or I'd bring brought food, or we'd eat. 
talk a bit of rubbish for a bit, and we'd go. And then the next thing I'd know, it come morning, it'd go, oh, look, I've just had one of these, or I've had two of these. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's why you're called Lucky Lucky, and that's why I'm a nobody. Because <laughs> he was catching loads, and I, and I was catching the odd one. And then one night, we sat in his bivvy, beep, 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 boof, he's into one. So I go out and I net it. And as it's come up and the head torch has just caught it, there's a great big ball of magic hanging out of his lip here. And I just turned around and looked at him and went, you twat. And that was and that was the first time I'd ever seen anybody using maggots. Ripping it apart. So he told me, he, he, he told me what he was doing. So out of respect, I stayed off. At the time, I was fishing lunch and me. Well, yeah. Great big long hair, great big long rigs and long hairs. And I was putting loads of finely chopped meat in and a bit of hemp and a bit of this and a bit of that. And I was catching the odd one. I wasn't not, I was catching still. But prob- Same areas or were you, what, were you, what were you doing during that winter period? Uh, Lockie was predominantly fishing the central area of the lake because it's the best description. It's not a true description. The best description is there's a plateau yeah. in the middle. Yeah. It, it's it's a shallow area, shallower area, mm. um, and I was tending to go round the edges and on some of the distinct features where there's like little drop offs and all sorts of things, little gravel patches. Um, so I was catching, I was doing my own thing, which was happy, and I wasn't impinging on my friend's success. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. He lost it about November time. Definitely it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and then he caught it. We had a, he had some friends over. Um, a guy called Alphonse, and I can't remember Alphonse's mate's name. They're Austrian, and they came over. George, his name was, and they came over, and Lockie had it. Mega, uh, stunning. That was. April time ish. How big was he then? Fifty four, I think. Okay, so he'd climbed. Yeah, fifty four. But yeah, and then um, I mean, it been out of all sorts. It carried on. I mean, I think it came out of fifteen. Well, it came out sixty. 60 yeah, yeah, it yeah. came out of sixty four once. Well, did it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it did. The guy didn't want to say anything. Did he not? No. I knew about it, so he must. Have, somebody must have said something. Well, no, uh, Matt Ridley had it at 60-odd as well. It might have been 63 or 61. Okay, maybe it was that then. No, there was a guy from Sheffield who had it and just didn't want anybody to know he'd had it. 64 was big. Yeah. Um, so I carried on doing my thing. Of course, Lockie had done it, so he went off to Pastures New. Yeah. And I carried on fishing, and I caught it. Not that November, the following November, so basically a year and a half later. Um, Swim? Where were you? I was on one of the points, the right-hand point, and it was one of those with mobile phone, but pre-internet on phones. Yeah. So I'd I'd fished every night that week, and I'd been really lucky. I'd caught... I fish every night and then gone to work. So by the time I come back, somebody was in the swim. So I'd gone to a new swim, fished, caught one, and done it. And I'd done four nights. And had one every night. I had one every night. And then Friday night, I arrived in the dark and the point was free. This is right at the start of November. Uh, conditions looked perfect. The, the weather forecast for the weekend had been perfect. Put the rods out. I'd won that night, uh, twenty odd, and then the following day was flat, calm, bright sunshine, no wind, horror. And I'm just on the back of doing five straight nights and going to work every day and minging and all the rest of it. And I'm just sat there thinking, I want to go home. So I phoned my mate up who, who unbelievably, he hadn't 
he wasn't on that weekend. And I, f- I phoned him up and said, uh, just go on your computer, mate, and have a look at the weather forecast. And he said, I oh, know there's a big weather front coming in, definitely. And I'm sat there, like three o'clock in the afternoon, looking, going, <coughs> Where is it? Where is it? Yeah. And he's going, No, it's coming, it's coming. It's coming from the south. I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says, No, it's coming. So I said, Oh, I'll stop. I'll stop. Just before it went dark, I can, I'm looking south and I can see this little black line like that, just in the distance. Hope yet. Well, I must have, I think I probably had a kebab that night, had a couple of cans, and gone to bed. Next thing I know, I'm woken up by what felt like somebody throwing a bucket of water in my face. It was chucking it down, coming straight. I hadn't even thought of it. Bro- Broly's still faced opening. It's like... Yeah, it's horrible, that. And I'm like, oh, God, God. Pull all the pegs out, drop it down so it's about this far off the floor. Crawl into bed again, and I'm just thinking, I know I wanted this, but this is just shit. <laughs> so I'm just like, Bleh. Anyway, about three o'clock in the morning, beep, 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 get out. Oh, nice one. Big, big common, probably 28 to 30 pound. Just that. Oh, oh. At the time, still sack him. So little bay to me left, walks him out, states him, there he is. Get back in, I'm thinking, well, that was worth it, wasn't it? That was worth it. Must have nodded off, because beep, 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 again. Oh, go out. I remember it. I'm, I'm reeling, not connecting with anything, because it should be out there. And as I'm reeling, I'm sort of doing that. And I'm like, and it's over here. And like, it's weird. It sort of felt big but didn't feel big, and it was on the surface, and I'm not really, I'm half asleep, not yeah. really paying any attention. And it's come up in front of me, and I'm like, it won't come over the net. And then it suddenly dawned on me, it won't come over the net, because it can't, because it's beached itself. Jesus, what? The reason why it doesn't fight was because it was Benson, and it's flapping around on the top like it used to. So I've just marched in, scooped it up, and I've just stood there up to my knees in water going, looking at it going, yep, yep, that's it, that's it. <laughs> so, yeah, quite funny. So everybody came round, really lucky. Everybody came round in the morning, got the pictures done, and uh, we, we went we went round to the local pub to uh, have a pint to celebrate at like 12 o'clock on the Sunday. And I've walked in through the pub and there's a great big banner across the wall in the pub and it just said, at fucking last. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Brody. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I'm just, I was just laughing my head off. I had a, I had a great afternoon, uh, drank far too much and a good friend of mine gave me a lift home and I'd nodded off as we'd, as we'd driven home. And he's pulled up outside my house and he's gone, Brody? I'm going, yeah. He says, we're here. And I'm going, where are we? Where are we? He says, home, Brody. You've come, mate. I've <laughs> yeah. not seen this in a while. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. And he sort of guided me to the front door and pushed me in. <laughs> there you go, mate. So that was that was Benson. And then, of course, I unwittingly, because I'd been on there for such a long time. Yeah. And I mean such a long time. Talk about boring a fish out. I properly bored it out. But, mate, you got it. Yeah, it it, it did. It was out of sympathy. That fish gave up the ghost out of sympathy. Why Why do you think you didn't have it early doors? Or even, to be fair, you're fishing five nights a week and you're catching. You're on... You're on, you're on. I think it was the, the lack of consistency. So I was fishing, leaving, fishing, leaving. Rather than sitting on it. So the uh, in the early days there came uh, there was a bit of a pattern just in that interim period bit the build up to when I caught it there was a lot of guys caught it and they were all guys that fished three or four days right and it always got caught they used to go out bait really heavily really tightly with small boilies yeah uh, and it often came on the third day. 
and it was often a random daytime bite. So it set this little thing, uh, but I couldn't emulate that because I was coming. You got to go. go. You got to work. Yeah. What? What? Bait wise, what did you? What did you have it on? Rig wise, all that sort of stuff. I had it. I had it on maggot. Did you have it on maggot? Yeah. Um, but I'd caught on all sorts. Yeah. And it was the simplest maggot rig ever. Stiff hook link on a long shank hook with a hair with a great big ball of maggots on, and it was stiff, so it didn't. So it was always presented, and it wasn't ever going to foul itself. Mm. And it was probably the first time that I'd fished truly stiff rigs and realised that it's better to have a good presentation all of the time than not have a good presentation some of the time. Yeah. Uh, and it was it was one of those that I'd done it and it worked and it was something that sort of stuck with me after that. But... Yeah, I caught it, so I moved on. So luckily for me, I'd got across the road because Swan is the other side of Willow Brook. God, Swan is a scratcher and a half. It's a tough old beastie. So I'd had Benson in the November. Benson was what when you caught it? Fifth, it was either 57.12 or 57.14. Which is ginormous, isn't it? It was huge, mate. Blown away, and it is the only fishing picture that I've got on my wall. Yeah, you said that. That's the only one. Yes, yeah, some carp, mate, in it. Uh, mate. I made so many good friends that are lifelong friends. We had so much fun. Uh, yeah, it was a bit of a strange time because i was so obsessed but there was a lot of good came out of it and i enjoyed it and nobody was hurt in the making of that particular thing no uh, but not everybody gets that fairy tale ending do they no not at all not at all and i was lucky and then was lucky in the fact that i went on to see numerous other people yeah become very happy with that fish I think it had been cut i think if memory serves me correct, when it died, I think it had been caught 63 times. 63. So that shows you just how many people it made happy. Yeah. I mean, there's a great picture of um, a guy like Andy. Oh, I forgot his first name. Anyway, Andy, and he had Benson and Hedges as a brace. No way. And when they were small... And that's where the name came from. That's he. He named him. Yeah, I love that. I love going back through that. Well, you know, when you used to have the website where you could go back through the years. Yeah, and you'd see him. Yeah, that was quite. It was same with Swan and Zed and the likes of the creature and that. that lot, it was the same, wasn't it? You could go and see him over time. Yeah. So I went on to Swan. So I sort of started March, April. What year? Oh, tough one. 2007, maybe. Okay, yeah. I was in 2009, so about, early doors. About that, I would guess. Yeah. That middle, middle 2000s. Yeah. Um. So, started, never felt comfortable on Swan for ages. Just, something about it, I couldn't, I didn't click with it at first. I was the same, like scratching. Do you always feel like you're scratching? Yeah, nothing. Yeah, nothing to go off. And then... I'd found a little spot over on the far side. There was a little lump close in. I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were willing to feed on that. Getting them to feed was a bastard. Uh, but they were willing to feed on that. And then anyway, one, it, it was it was when we very first started UK Carp because uh, Dave was the front cover shot of the first issue. Of course he. And I caught it that week. Off that hump? Yeah. Maggots again or not? No, that was, um, I can't, that was Scopex Squid. On the old Nash bait, boy. Uh, I think all my captures uh, on, from Swan, were all on Scopex Squid. Every single one. Fair dues. That's why you struggled so much. I'm joking. (laughs) No, no, still still my favourite bait ever. Yeah? Bar none. Bar none. I can remember having the uh, 
conversation with uh, Julian Cundiff when the key had stopped yes. being made. Yes, that's right. And he was still writing for us then. And uh, he'd gone all, oh, I don't know about this this new stuff, and, you know. And he was really, you could see it, it just... A bit apprehensive, yeah, yeah, of course. And I just said to him, mate. Mate, he catches fish, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. It does, and it's various incarnations because it's had various guys, it's not it, but yeah. it, it, it's it's a good bait, very good bait. I caught shed loads of fish on it. Oh, yeah. So, get the so new one. I had that, and it would have been, when I had Dave, it was £40 an ounces. It's a mega fish, isn't it? And, yeah, it was 60, 60, 60 pound now? Mental. And I would have had it as a brace because I netted Dave. Dave was in the net and my other rod went and I was playing the creature. No. And I got it right and I was going to net it. I got two nets at that point. It was way before two, two nets had become... Two nets. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, give oh, over. Tommy, two nets. Jeez. Oh, you're lucky if I got one, son. Just get the gaff out. Exactly, mate. <laughs> Grab it up the bang, <laughs> yeah, headlock yeah, it. Yeah. So I'm about to double net it and... I'll never, I'll never forget it as long as I live. It just came out. You know when it swings towards you? Oh, it's gutting. I just caught the rig and I, I sort of, <laughs> I sort of slid my hand down it, and the hook had snapped, and the hook was like a pin. So I got the, I got the, the shank of the hook, the eye, none of the rest of it, and just my hair rig with the boilie on the end. Oh, that's horrendous! And that was it, and it, it snapped, and I would have had a brace of forty and a fifty. And that's. A- I mean, there's others, but they're they're the two you want, aren't they? Yeah. So that was that. So carried on fishing, learned more, and it started gelling. Talk uh, to me about that. Well, how did it gel? You knew what weather conditions, what areas triggered them. Oh, okay. And you could actually they were that predictable for a while that you could preempt them by knowing what the weather forecast was. Really? Yeah. So at that time, very few people fished up the southern end. Yeah, okay. And they, when a big southerly came in and blew up there. They're in there. The first three or four hours of that wind, you could catch them. And you'd, everybody would be sat there going, Ooh, wrong end of the lake. And you've got them going like that, like a dolphin show over the top of you. Would you have them quite close in there? Yeah, really yeah, close. yeah, there. yeah. yeah. So caught a lot of fish doing that, and then, of course, it was quite the opposite extreme, yeah. the northerly into the causeway. That's where I've had them, quite long. Yeah, and then when you understand how the undertow and the hatches work, you've got that spot. There's that area where yeah. they feed, and they feed a lot, and they like to be. So but that's two swims, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Um, yeah. Were you able to do that? Was it scarce, scarce enough or still busy enough that you couldn't get in those two? It wasn't too bad. It wasn't too bad. There wasn't that many people that were really concentrating on it. Okay. Um, odd, odd one. And again, another, another great place for some friends. So I caught Dave then. I caught the creature the following year at 53... Something like that. And then it was always going to be the Zed was the hardest fish because it was a once a year fish. Yeah, yeah. I'd caught Dave again uh, and then was concentrating on the Zed. But the Zed was the one that you didn't fit into any of the tick boxes because it only came out once a year. And this particular year, it came out early-ish. So sort of end of April, May. And I thought, am I going to waste the rest of me? Yeah, yeah, just plugging away. Because it do not get caught. And I got a Monk's ticket at that point. Green Acres was just all kicking off. Jeez. So there was there was lots of things going on. And I just, it was just one of them. Are you still doing five nights here at this point as well? No, no, I can't. East I'd, off? Yeah, yeah. I'd gone, it's relentless, that. Yeah, no, I'd gone... Back to the real world, instead of instead of, instead of living like Stig of the Dump. Um, so I just I just eased off because it come out, and uh, a friend of mine 
from up in Stoke phoned me up and said, oh, I'm coming down. Do you, do you want a fit? I said, yeah, 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 I'll do a couple of nights with you, mate. And it was a bit bizarre. So the guy fishing opposite where my mate was fishing was somebody that I knew. And he'd absolutely, I knew he'd absolutely filled it in with Skypex squid. Okay. Absolutely. And I mean, filled it in. And then something happened and he'd left. So I rock up to fish with me mate. Yeah. Well, you know what that place is like. By chance, the swim next door is free, which is directly opposite where this bloke's been fishing. Mm. So I quite literally put out three solid bags yeah. of mushed up scopet squid with matching hook baits on, little barrels that they were with a little tiny pop up on. Bang, 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 right across the back of his baited area. Yeah. Nothing happened. Following morning, I'd seen a few fish show. Packing up, I just got three rods there. Landing net had gone. Unicky mat was gone. I've just got three rods. And we're having a cup of tea and a fag before I went to work. And the rod just went deep, 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 and held. But here you go. Round, mates there. By the time he's got the landing net out. So he says, Oh, it's a good one. It's a good one. And that's it. He says, oh, it's a really good one. I said, which one is it? He says, oh, it's 50. Oh, God, which one is it? Which? So I ran down the bank. I flipped it over on its side, jumped in my van, yeah, driven down to the shop, kicked the door off the hinges, stood in front of this picture of the Zed fish and gone, yeah! What have you done? <laughs> yeah, it was... <laughs> It was that fish, and I was just like confirming the. So I've driven back up, and this bloke must have thought I, I was the weirdest man ever. So we've got it all, and it's come time to wait. And there's a guy driving along the track, and I've just stopped him. I said, "Hey, mate, can you do us a favour?" Yeah, I said, "Can you come away with this fish, please?" He says, "Why?" I said, "I don't want to get be anywhere. I don't know what it was. I was just I don't want to be anywhere near it." And this bloke was so. Borley, my mate, and, and this guy, who I don't know from Adam, weighed it, and it was 49.15. Oh. And that was, and that was the Z. And that was, oh, no, that didn't matter. I was, I was just, that was a good feeling, catching that fish, because that was a hard fish to catch. And that's why you smoke, kids. No, I'm <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And that's why you always hang on for that last fag. You never do know. <laughs> don't smoke, kids. Don't smoke. No, 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 no. But, uh, what an absolute mate that's ridiculous and it it was exciting and then obviously you step away and i've i've dabbled but i've never really been back i've I've been and fished and i still go and see lynn and tony now uh because god they pulled with me for all those years and was just so lovely and uh but it was uh yeah it's weird i go back now and just People are showing me pictures of fish, and I'm going, "Oh, where's that one?" And they're going, "Oh, that's such and such, and it's in that." Is it? It's bloody hell! There's so many big fish in there. It's now. ridiculous, isn't it? But I think, like, yeah, I don't know if it's just me looking at it again through rose tinted glasses in time. But that period before I fished it, when Benson was around, when you had the creature. Yeah. By the time I think I'd got there, Benson had gone. The creature was in a case at yep. the tone, had it mounted. Yep. I was there when it was being sorted. So I was there after that lot. Yeah. That was like heyday in terms of those fish. They were the ones, weren't they? Yeah, it was indeed. And it's funny that you look back and there's a few fish that were nondescript mm. then that I'm convinced are some of the... Some of the yeah. yeah, 100%. And it, it's weird. There's a couple of, a couple of big commons that... We, They're hard to tell those comments, yeah, but they? they were they were just just coming onto the scene. You know when you've got a water that's dominated by commons, yeah. The ones that are, especially when you've got a hierarchy, the, the next lot down tend to all just dis- you go get missed off, don't they? Yeah, and it was just then that you could say, "Oh, that's that." So there was a box common. There was one. There was another one. There was a scar. Um, yeah, and Scar, I had, Scar's a very recognisable one. I had that fish at uh, 
I think I had it at 27 and 37, and I think it's now 57, Jeez, I think. It's a big fish, yeah. yeah. It's mad, isn't it? It's just ridiculous as a complex. Like, there's it, like even Sam Martin, man, like, they throw up massive fish, mate, all the time. Yeah, well, ridiculous. it was funny, me and Little Rich, we had, uh, after all that, we had uh, a little campaign one summer and autumn fishing Sam Martin when nobody fished it. yeah. We had loads, loads of nothing. Nice fishing there. Yeah, but nothing monstrous, but great fun, water to yourself, fish that you got out that you went, man, look at that. You, you you only want one of these. Look at him, look at him. It was some cracking ones. And they were the, sort of the new guard coming through that had very quietly gone about the business growing and eating, and all of a sudden it's, oh. Yeah. Oh. Hello. But, again, Mallard, when the fish were sort of set free accidentally in Mallard, um, that place was rich and still yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just one of them that's got a bit of everything. It's got a bit of deep. It's weedy. It's got lots of nice shallows, a lot of fresh water coming in and out. Uh and God, they are just growing and growing and growing. That's ridiculous. And it's doing monster bloody bream. It's doing monster tench. It's just you like... You can have those, mate, I reckon. No, oh, beauties. You love yeah. them, don't you? Big old bream and big old tench? Yeah. I don't mind a big tench. Big bream. Yeah, maybe if it's about like £20. What's no. the British record at the moment? About 22, I think. There you go. I'll take a 20 pound. I don't want to scare the record. <laughs> no, that's very nice of you. <laughs> I'll leave them to you because you're trying to catch them by design. Oh, God. Well, it's, it's harder to pack, track down a decent bream water than you think. What no, you no, a real, when you're talking the big girls, there's only a handful. Is there? There's only a handful. Oh, no, the record is you said that's still alive. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah. That that is hard. That's hard. <laughs> that, yeah. Or take a really big seine net and just keep no, it going. No, no. <laughs> well, according according to you, carp anglers, you just got to turn up, ca- turn up, cast a ten mil pop up out, and you'll catch it. Steve, <laughs> I am the least ego driven man out there, mate. I'm a complete and utter nod. All right, but you put me anywhere on this earth. Mate, and I will find a bream if it's in there. You can put me on the Zambezi River, mate, with a law. North. And a, mate, I went, I went Rutland a few years ago, jigging for Zander, mate. Caught two bream. Incredible angling, mate. See, What's that all about? You're the next John Wilson. <laughs> I've got, no, mate, honestly, bream. Oh, it's frighteningly horrible. We don't need to go down bream banks, mate. Let's leave all that, that dark art somewhere else. I must have done something in a former life or something to a bream, and now they're just taking revenge on me. Um, th- that, in terms of a chapter, obviously, I mean, I'm not, I don't know if it is, but from what I can hear and recall in your voice and how passionately you talk about it, that that is very much one place or two lots, if you like, of fish that have really made an impression and captivated you. Is that the most you've been sort of into that? I would have said yes. I was I was 101% obsessed. Yeah. And I was lucky. And we say that, I say that a lot. I was lucky. I was lucky because at that time, the group of people that were fishing it, it was a really nice place to be. It was funny. It was one of those things that you can look back on fondly and go, I was lucky to be part of that little scene mm. then. And people being genuinely, who who have watched you struggle, who've seen you not catch or seen you catch and not catch what you want, come and shake your hand and go, brilliant, you've caught it, well done. And it, it, it was exceptional. It was exceptional seeing... It's a very joyous thing when you meet somebody that shared your experience and then shakes your hand and looks you in the eye and you know they mean it and they've gone, yeah. well done. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it, because of respecting some of those guys a lot, it meant a lot as well. Yeah, and the struggle, mate. You yeah. need that. If you go there and pub chuck a bag and have it, it's not the same. So it, it, was, a, it was a good run. Loved every moment of it. 
and but things move on. And for me, lots of just after that, lots of things happened in my life, and I wasn't that driven. Things had happened that made you have a look and think, mm, fishing's not that important in life. Mm. So was otherwise distracted, and I ended up moving to just down the road from Bluebell and ultimately on the doorstep of Greenacres. Yeah, you said you can literally see it from your house, can't you? In the winter, I can actually see it from my kitchen window. <laughs> That's incredible, mate. Um and so I'm quite proud because obviously Dave Manny and his family, I've known them from years growing up with them uh, and I've been great friends and I've seen how it's all developed, I've seen all the hard work that's gone into it. Yeah. The panic, the blood, the sweat, the tears of what fishery owners go through every day with predators, floods, oxygen crashes, you name it, the thousand and one things that could change everything in the blink of an eye. Yeah, livestock's a nightmare, isn't it? Yeah. And now uh, Dave and his family have got this place that makes people look good. It is so full of quality fish. It is an unbelievable venue. Uh, Beautifully manicured, reasonably peaceful, great big fish, beautiful surroundings with good friends. But I've seen it all. I've seen it go through day ticket bits and and, and all its various guises. I've seen the stock change from the original Bill big commons that were in there uh, to the big mirror that made 50 and then passed away to now the up and coming ones that are like big forties. I know the big mirror, but that's gone. Yeah. So, so what's, what have you got now in there? Well, originally you had two 40 pound commons and the big mirror, right? But the big mirror was, so the commons were for argument's sake, 44, 41 and the mirror was about 37. Right. Something like that. Yeah. What was that at the start? At the start. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then Big Common went first. Right. So then you got the now new Big Common and Mirror, and they both both sort of grew up. Then the that common went went. And then the Big Mirror went on to do Yeah, that did fifty, <sighs> didn't it? Fifty one something. Yeah, it was low fifty, yeah, yeah. 51 something. Uh, again, friend of mine, Steve Smith, had it from up in Staffordshire. Uh, and that was that. And then now the, the new replacements now, um, you've got a mirror that hovers between 46 and 48. Nice. Um, uh, there's another one at 45. There's a common about 45. Um, there's probably going on. Eight to ten forty, something like that. How big's that lake? Like? Eight to ten acres. Yeah, it's sim- it's a bit weird because it's changed ever so slightly. Because uh, Dave had a well, he had two stock ponds at the back, and then his own little lake that was in front of his house. Right now, it's all one in okay. a big snake. He's he's broken through everything, so it's quite exciting. In the spring, especially spring and summer, because they can be anywhere. They can be, they can be right around tucked in, basically his back garden, uh, or there's lots of places for it to get, and it, it it makes them move a bit, and it gets quite exciting. But yeah, nice place to fish. Um, not loads of members. Dave's very particular about who he has on. Yeah, it's in his back garden, like you said. Yeah, and. But he he only has guys that are working yep. and all the rest of it. So and family, so they don't you don't get any time bandits on there or yeah, yeah, course. Uh, so yeah, no, it's, a, it's a beautiful place to fish. And for me, I'm a bit spoiled because I am good friends with the owner. And B, it is uh, joking aside, it is virtually in my back garden. Um, so I'm quite connected with it. Um, 
keys to catching them on there? What have you found? Is it location? Is it quite weedy? What 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 have you done? It's got it's gone through it's gone through various phases. Um, the 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 recent flooding has altered weed and things fluctuating. We get far more fluctuating water levels now, and we get lots of very massive changes of depth. So you can have a really wet winter, so it will be bank high, mm. and then you can have a scorching summer, which drops it down to, like, you, you can use, lose three-foot vertical height. Wow. So it changes things. Water's rich, very rich, because you've got lots of, sh- you've got nice contrast of deep and silty gravel. You've got, sh- you've got everything. Clay, you've got the lot. Um, these days, because it's been fished a lot, they respond massively to food. In fact, the more you can put in, the more you catch. Really? Yeah. Um, and it is. It is, and it doesn't always work like like anything. Carp, carp, aren't they? Fish, a fish. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but as in normal conditions, from probably about April through to about now, if I was giving anybody advice to go there, I would say go out, find yourself a nice clear bit, stick ten kilos of boilies out, sit, sit and wait. And some point in forty eight hours, they'll turn up, clear you out, and you'll have two or three. If you if you're good and skilled, you keep it working, and you can hang on to them and make a big catch of fifteen, twenty. Um, but you've you've got to work. You've got to work it. It's almost like match fishing. And then the great thing is, certain times of the year they're on massive hatches, so yeah. you can't you can't compete with that. Full stop. Yeah, you know, when when the entire invertebrate population of the lake's trying to crawl out of the lake, uh, so. You ever had a bite over them in that condition? Zigs, whatever, you tried them? It can be tough. I know, it's tough. It can be tough. And we've got some, there's a couple of guys that fish down there that are really good fly anglers. You know, they both fish for England, actually. And uh, they just look, and they know their stuff, and they just look and go, might as well go home. Because what what we see isn't half of it. That's just living soup now. They're just swimming around like basking sharks. So... Beautiful place, nice, so user friendly. Getting old, don't want barrows, don't want any of that nonsense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like your barbecue, <laughs> park the car behind the swim, <laughs> go fishing. Just nice, easy fishing. Yeah, and beautiful place to be. We get, uh, we're really lucky. The old osprey comes down from Rutland. We see, yeah. we see that in the, mate. You see it in the spring every year now. Probably the third, fourth year. Wicked. And you just see it come down and take the odd rod and. It, it it must that that must it must swim swim fly down from Rutland. Swim. Well, it might do. <laughs> That's where that forty pound <laughs> comment's gone. Yeah, yeah. the Osprey's at it. So, uh, but he he must go over it because because it's all fenced. Yeah, uh, he must just go over it and go. Oh my god, look at this! Bloody McDonald's. Yeah, it does. Somebody's left the roof off McDonald's. <laughs> Here we go, boys. So yeah, very lucky. So. Don't know where the future's taken me. I'm still obsessed with pike fishing, so still do that. You've uh, had some big ones, mate. I mean, well, you're on, you've been on chew this season, haven't you? Yeah, I've had, been lucky this season. I've had a, 27's been the best th- this year, but I've had oh, I've, I've had a couple of 34 pluses out of chew. So, how many 30s you had in total? Two, four, five, uh, five. Showing off, lad. Five. Sorry, five. Five. Just skip to 30, yeah? Just yeah. skip to 30. I forgot about it. Flopped him. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible, mate. Yeah, I had one where I shouldn't have been fishing and I forgot about it. <laughs> so a bit, yeah, a bit, of, a bit of forgotten chapters. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so... Broad, yeah. are you rebel? No, you don't work in the industry. No, you just do what you want, don't no, you? No, I just got lost. Yeah, just got lost. Me, you, that, me, you've seen <laughs> me map was upside down. That's all it was. Me map was the wrong way around. Those videos where like, you go... <laughs> We were going to work and somehow ended up fishing. <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> All <yeah>. over. Yeah. <laughs> That's quality. Yeah, fair play. That's some pike fishing. So pike fishing is winter's going to happen. It's already happening. Yeah. What about the future? Stay fishing at Green Acres, go pastures and new carp fishing, or very much sort of I think green I'm, tench, you, 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 you sort of normal I, I think I, I think I'm a mixture. I think I'm trying to 
The trouble is, Greenie is so easy and being lazy because it's there and it's on a plate. And I like it and I like the people. So it's quite hard to walk away from that. Take that. And it really is. I would love to find something cart fishing wise that makes me tick and it pulls on the old heartstrings. I think I may have found it. But, Sounds positive. But like anything, in the modern day world, you need to be sure you're not chasing ghosts. Oh, this sounds like you're going full five nights a week again, bro. Yeah. Well, with otters and one thing and another, and if you are going to ch- chuck your hat in the ring and go for something a little bit off the beaten track, you need to know it's still there, do you? Really? Yeah. Uh, I have never caught a double figure tench, much to my disgust of myself. So I would still like to have that little box ticked. You do that. And I've just of late, I've had Bream up, my personal best is 16, 14. And I've just just recently started getting a little itch again that I might want to catch or try to catch a bigger one. But as I said before, as soon as you start getting that size, there isn't that many places. My PB is £17.4. See, John Wilson. And I could take you to a place where you definitely catch one, mate. But you have to fish dirty great boilies, try and catch a carp, and all you can catch is slab upon slab upon slab. There's no quintessential British summertime mornings and lift floats. Oh, no, 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 no. Bite alarms and dirty great bottom bakes. Um, yeah, mate, I can I can tell you a place to catch some big bream, mate. Oh, well, we'll, t- we'll, we'll talk about that later. Yeah, you'll catch uh, that. You'll un- definitely do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, under arm guard. No, mate, it'll be all right. Don't worry. I don't think a lot of people want them, but you do, which is good. If you're catching them by design, it's fair dues, but on a cart rod, it's not the one. Yeah, so it's good. I think on a positive note, you you really don't know what's around the next corner. I couldn't have predicted that I'd be here five years ago, so therefore I don't know where I'm going to be in five years. Hopefully still as mad as a hat and doing it all and still enjoying it, because that's the point. I love it. That's the key in it, mate. Definitely. Mate, it's brilliant to have you in. It genuinely has. It's a bit surreal seeing you like on the TV, reading all your publications, all your media, seeing you at Bluebells photographing tension. I remember you on a feature and doing some photography for somebody. I can't remember who was angling. All that sort of time, our paths have never really crossed. But to spend some time with you, to hear about everything, for you being so open and sort of opening up about everything that's gone on and what you've done, I massively, massively, massively appreciate it, mate. Yeah, my pleasure, mate. It's been great fun, really easy, and just really good fun. Thanks, mate. Before you go, this is the not so easy bit. I've got some quick fire questions. Yep. That you are not preempted for. Um, let's see how you do here, mate. I'll be interested. Um, which one of these would you choose? A UK 60 pounder or a foreign 100 pounder? This is on the carp front, mate. Mm-hmm. Foreign 100 pounder. Yeah, go on the wrong ones. I'm joking. Um, three celebrities you'd take fish in. Past or present? Uh, oh, God. That is a tough one. God. He's taking God. Yeah, I'm taking God. <laughs> that, that'll make life easy. I'm getting on. Sort this out. I need a big break. Uh, Jim Morrison. Yeah. For one. Nice, cool. Uh, Richard Walker, because I'd want to pick his brains about a couple of things. And um, probably Keira Knightley. Keira Knightley. You've got to have a woman you can get naked for, haven't you? Well, that's it. It's it's only just to exercise my ghosts and keep my (laughs) mental health up. You'll understand. Bend it like Beckham. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, if you were back in the fishing industry, what job role do you think you'd take? More than anything, I would, because it's such a complicated thing, I would love to be involved in tackle development. Would you? Product development? Mm. I did not pick that one. Fair dues. Uh, drum and bass or country and western? Drum and bass. Oh, broadie. I'm trying. 
I was going to no, I was going to say something that you would have had to use the bleep machine then. Remember, don't listen to drum and bass. Don't <laughs> they don't want to listen to country and western either. <laughs> yeah, I think they do. Oh right, that's well country and western, mate. <laughs> Going on the fence for some bream. <laughs> um, uh, one angler to catch a carp to save your life. Who would it be? Terry Hearn. Yeah, good call. Well done. Uh, best advice you've ever been given, Mister Bays. Feed them and they will come. <laughs> yeah, <Bayesy> what a <laughs> uh, one species to catch for the rest of your life. Pike. No hesitation there either, is there? No. S- loves a pike, this boy. Right, if you could have starred in one of these two TV shows, which one would it have been? Matt Hayes, Great, or any of the Rod Races, or Go Fishing? Ooh. I know. Ooh, that's a toughie. Both excellent. Both excellent. That's a caveat. What are you going to pick, mate? We're not here for the political answer. I've, I've now fished with both, uh, but I would go for the sheer variety. I would go with go fishing because it is sharks. You, it could have been anything. You could have been fishing for anything anyway. Good save. You got out of that lovely. Final question, mate. A night out on the bank or a night in with the missus or respected woman? Kira Knightley, I think we've done <laughs> Uh, on the bank. Yeah, go on, boy. <laughs> Honestly, Matt, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. Thank you guys for watching and listening. I'll be back soon with another podcast. Until then, Steve Broad, thank you so much, mate. My pleasure. Cheers, guys. <laughs>